get started. Um, hi, everybody. I'm a uh, kid from Software AG. I know most of you are Arnold Tice, who is the global leader, global business unit leader for Adabase and Natural. And he'll kind of uh, kind of do an introduction and a welcome and give you some insight into the Adabase Natural world. And uh, then I'll kind of go through a couple of uh, small housekeeping things. We'll be followed by Josh Elkins from Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles. He's going to talk about a journey to agile development. And Josh, uh, back in April, I think it was, did this user group or did this presentation at the International User Group in Dublin, Ireland. So, Josh, we appreciate you attending the IUG and attending today's user group. That will be followed by Ellie Cohen, who is um, a member of our product management team, and he'll be doing achieve application high availability in the distributed architecture, followed by uh, Helen Kretzman from Denver Support and Nicole Ritchie from Product Marketing. They're going to be talking about how to build your skills, not only software AG skills, but also IBM skills like JCL or whatever it is. Hel Helen's going to give you an introduction into that with IBM Z Explorer. Then we're going to take a, a quick 10 minute break and it is going to be a break, but I'm also going to be giving out five uh, Amazon gift cards at the break. Um, I'll just be doing a random draw from everybody who registered. You do have to be present to win. You know, you have to be on. So give me a second to kind of pull out some names and you could say, yes, I'm here or put it in the chat, that kind of thing. After the break, Julie Rowe is going to talk about how to modernize natural applications for the web with natural for Ajax. Then, as always, our Denver support um, presentations are in high demand. So Kurt Hansen from Denver Support, Adabase Natural Support, is going to do natural APIs and other hints. Then Donnie Bierman and Demos Economicos will be doing data unleashed virtualization and synchronization for mission impact. And then yet another one from support, Adabase DBA 101, how to deal your DD cards. And for you DBAs out there, you guys know that there's all these DD cards, DD card, DD carta, DD print, DD drug, all those. Kurt's going to explain what they all are and how they're all used. And then at the end, during our wrap up, I'm going to give away another five Amazon gift cards. And we're going to do some light housekeeping. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a survey, all that kind of stuff. So with that, I'm going to now pass it over to Arnold Tice. And again, Arno is the global head of Adabase and Natural. Thank you, Arno, for attending. Thank you very much, Becky. Thank you for inviting me. I think this is a very important event since our largest Adabase Natural community is actually located in, in the US or in North America in, in, in general. So great event and uh, great stuff you are going to talk about. Um, I would like to welcome everyone on that call, and I think I have some good news. Um, we Internally, we did some very positive restructuring, and now we are in a position to bring global support, R&D, product management, and professional services closer together. They all belong now to the BU, I mean also professional services and global support. So all hands on deck uh, to ensure customer success. Uh, we anyway had a great collaboration between all departments uh, dealing with a and at Software AG, but I can tell you for the future, it will even be better. And I would like to refresh our commitment uh, to innovation. So Adabas Natural 2050 plus is really alive and we could talk about a lot, what does it mean? But I'm here just to highlight a few things uh, where we are focusing on. And uh, in the follow up you have seen the agenda, there are much more topics, but it is all about commitment to innovation. And it starts with infrastructure flexibility. The customer will have the choice between IBM ZOS and hybrid cloud or Linux and containers, and also the choice when the customer decides to 
uh, move Adapas Natural into the cloud. Free choice on whether it's AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. So we support all of that. You can feel comfortable on a mainframe. You can feel comfortable in the cloud. You will hear about high availability also in the cloud later. So great stuff. And there's more to come also with the October release we are planning for. Operational excellence is one of our targets. It's about workload efficiency. And very important uh, topic clearly is uh, data security. It becomes more and more important nowadays. And you are used using Adabas Natural. You are familiar. You are used to high availability and resilience. But we still continue working on that and improving this. Agility and modernization. We continue with our natural one DevOps approach. Uh, we will probably in the upcoming years also refresh our natural one approach. API and data integration. And for data integration, you know, we have also Connex, which is under the umbrella of Adapas Natural. Um, you uh, will see more to come from there. And a very important uh, topic is managing the generational change, where we would love to work together with all of you on that. Uh, I can tell you we had an, one of the best international user group in the recent past this year in Dublin. Many attendees, many participants, many presenters also from the customer side. And what was really great to see how many young people join companies and start doing Adabas DBA or programming. So it is possible to attract young talents because it is not just about the programming language. Working with Adabas Natural means in most of the cases, and you probably know that better than me, means in most of the cases you are working at the heart of your company because most of the Adabas Natural applications are mission critical to the customers. And this is very interesting for young talents to do such an important job. If you can move to the next slide, to give you a quick overview, we call it architecture the future. So we have really here two avenues, two legs, and you can combine both for sure. We have one which is working together with IBM on improving our applications on IBM C mainframe, leveraging their new features and functions for optimization and modernization. Also here we have this topic, DevOps security, very important encryption. The, ma the mainframe is known to be secure, but the data access and you, you never know if someone will try to hack also a mainframe so we should not be too comfortable so we can always do more and we are working on making it even more secure we offer also hybrid cloud mainframe in combination with the cloud and you know with our zip products in particular we are addressing also the topic of cost efficiency. On the Linux and cloud side, it's a transformation journey. Uh, actually, Adabas Natural is uh, cloud native. It runs in containers. We help you with lift and shift. If you are already on Linux, it's a small step to go to the cloud. Also, DevOps is very important here, in particular dealing with the cloud and we continue to innovate around microservices. So continuous investment. And to finish with my intro here, I give you another proof point that we take it seriously with Adabas Natural 2050 Plus. We are hiring this year in only in R&D 30 incremental people. So we are growing our R&D we investing in Adabas Natural moving forward. Thank you uh, for attending the user group today. 
I have to leave in a couple of minutes. Unfortunately, you know, in, in Germany, it's a bit later than <laughs> right now in the US. But if there are questions in particular to me, I'm sure uh, Becky will take care of that and forward it to me. I'm happy to answer those questions. So much fun, much success with this user group meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arno. Appreciate it very much. Uh, as Arno said, if uh, during any of these sessions, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. And Arno, if you haven't left yet, there was one question um, yeah. about uh, Silver Lake. Um, Nicole, since I can't look at that chat box right now, can you can you read the question to Arno, please? Hi, Arno. And the question is, uh, can you expand a little bit on the Silver Lake acquisition of Software AG last year and the sale of Software AG products to IBM? Yeah. So, as you know, we are in the process of selling Basically, we call it integration uh, software. We are selling uh, web methods product stack as well as uh, stream sets product stack to IBM. All other, uh, and uh, this includes, I think this is probably the background of your question. Uh, this includes also uh, some products which are heavily used by ANN customers, which is NTIAX and Applinks. But the future for those two products will be secured. Also, the R&D teams are moving with the products uh, to IBM, and we will be working closely uh, together with them. So for, for ANN, from your perspective, probably, Applings and NTIX have been part of ANN. For ANN, we will be an integrated business unit focusing on our products, including, uh, as I said before, Connex. And under Silver Lake, they are convinced about ANN. We get much more attention than we even got in the past <laughs> from our own management. So they are excited about uh, uh, a and N. What the future will bring, we will see it. But for now, we are building an integrated a and uh, business unit, which provides uh, a lot of opportunities to all of us. Uh, not only me, also our uh, management is excited about that. But personally, I guess for everyone at Software AG and a and we are very happy that we uh, get now support, attention, and budget for doing things more than in the recent past. So good future. But you should know, uh, if this is the background of the question, Applings and NTIAX, those two products are moving to IBM. We will continue working closely together uh, with those teams. Thank you. I hope Thank this you, answers Arno. the question. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Thank you, Arno. And again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat for any session. Just put them in there. We'll we'll monitor that and um and, and get those answered uh today. And um this this is being recorded so that if any of your coworkers couldn't attend today, it will be recorded. The presentations will be sent out uh after the um, user group meeting sometime probably next week or so. Um, just to kind of wrap up the beginning session here, I just want to remind you all that you can get these, what we call IT health checks. I should probably rename it to Adabase and Natural Health Checks. And if in, internally within Software AG, we don't say Adabase and Natural, we've abbreviated it to A and N, it's just easier. But these health checks, I've done them, you know, myself, Patrick, Bob, whoever, Eric, We've done so many of these over the decades. And remember, you can do these as many, as often as you want, every year, every couple of years. It doesn't cost you anything. And what we do, for those of you who haven't had one, is we will re, you know, we'll engage with you. It's usually the DBAs, uh, the uh, systems programmers, the um, natural programmers, COBOL programmers, whoever's involved with the database and natural world there. We'll look at performance, we'll make suggestions on how to do things, maybe change the parameters to make things run faster, or use less CPU, whatever. Those things that Arnold talked about on this slide, 
uh, those will also be covered as part of the health check. And at the end of the health check, you get a, a really big report that goes through everything we talked about. And these health checks can be done remotely now. They could be done on site, would fly to your location, meet with everybody you know, in a big conference room, or we can do it remote via Teams, whatever works for you all. Um, I'm not going to go through the roadmaps because we did that at the last user group, and we will do it again at the fall user group. We will have another user group this fall. But I wanted to show you that there are new releases coming out for Adabase on the mainframe, Adabase ZOS in October of this year, October of next year, and so on. Natural, there will be releases also for natural on the mainframe. And then Adabase also has major releases coming out this October as well. So just to kind of wrap up, here. Hey, Becky, do you mind closing uh, your uh, camera um, so we can preserve some bandwidth? We will have another user group in October, November time frame. Uh, presentations. In the chat, I'll come will work. Yep. Yeah, no. Problem. Any, uh, uh, just send me an email, put it in the chat box. Oh, yes. uh, like, uh, of course, database and natural. Kurt Hansen and his full portions as well. And you uh, since only five, three, five, something like that. Ten at the first, five at the first break, five at the end of this uh, user group. In the business Friday. We'll be entered. I am going to stop sharing and I'm Let Josh take over. Eric, you want to go? Becky, okay. no one could hear anything you were saying. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take over from here. And, and uh, introduce Josh. Go ahead, Eric. Eric I think okay. we can you? all hear you clearly, Eric. Okay, hear you. sounds good. Hello, everyone. Um, like I said, I'm Eric Wood, and I have the pleasure of introducing introducing uh, Josh Elkins. He is a um, a lead engineer for the. Turn your camera off, please. Okay. That's even a better picture. <laughs> so um, Josh is a uh, lead engineer for the MySelect application that runs at the, um, the Virginia uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, which is a front-end application that is used by all the branches, offices, as well as their external pa um, partners. Josh has been at the DMV for 18 years, I'm sorry, 16 years, where he started at the tender age of 16. So. Um, with that said, um, Josh likes to, in his spare time, um, do trail biking as well as researching new technologies. So with that said, I think I mixed those numbers up, but with that said, um, Josh, you can take it away. Okay, uh, great, Eric. Thank you. Um, first off, the typical, can everyone hear me? Sounding good, Josh. Can't wait to hear okay. you. Awesome. Okay. Um, so again, like Eric said, um, and thank you for the introduction and thank you guys for inviting me to speak today. 
Um, my name is Josh Elkins. I'm the lead engineer of the My Select application at the Virginia DMV. Um, Eric described it well, but overall, our application is the um, front end user interface that directly integrates with the database natural mainframe um, that the agency has been relying on for decades at this point. Um, so, what I want to go over today is um, how we are innovating and how we're modernizing at the Virginia DMV. Um, as everyone probably knows, it's you know, times have been different lately. So as far as modernization and as far as generational and cultural changes go, um, it's more it's more than just technology. It's a it needs to be a comprehensive um, discussion and it's a comprehensive process that's happening right now in front of all of us. So I want to share a little bit of what we see and what we're experiencing at our agency um, and then just go from there and give you guys um, just a high level overview of what we do, um, what we're working towards, um, how we're succeeding, and what we've learned from um, those efforts and the success that came from them. Um, so first off, uh, for those that may not be familiar, um, the Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles is a driver and vehicle licensing agency. Um, I'm not sure of how that translates internationally. However, um, we are the only body in the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, authorized to issue driver's licenses. Um, and vehicle titles and registrations. Um, so we're headquartered in Richmond, Virginia, which is where I sit today. Um, and we have about 80 customer service centers, 76 on this slide, uh, contact centers. Um, we have nearly 2,000 employees across the Commonwealth. Um, and let's see, as of fiscal year 2023, uh, we processed and issued more than 16.8 million transactions. Um, our online presence is pretty substantial at this point and we offer more than 50 online transactions and service offerings and i believe we were the first um, entity in the entire country or excuse me in the entire world to allow for um, an online driver's license renewal process and so with that um, i want to go kind of go through some of the more in-depth uh, services and what we offer with those um, you know like i said driver's license services uh, vehicle title transfers, registration and plates, um, the decals that go on the plates. Um, so those are the typical things people associate with uh, DMV. Um, but it's actually a little bit more than that. Um, we have a bigger footprint than most people realize. Um, in addition to those core services, we also offer uh, vital records access, which allows for a more convenient one-stop shop for customers to obtain a uh, birth certificate or um, any sort of legal presence document in that realm um, while they're actually at the branch. So it prevents them from having to make a long burdensome trip um, that they may not have been planning on making otherwise. Um, we also handle some voter registration. Uh, we are one of the major um, inputs for voter registration applications. Uh, while we don't actually process the applications because we are not that body, um, we do accept them um, and forward them on to the Department of Elections. Um, lastly, well, not lastly, but we offer things as convenient as hunting and fishing licenses, um, easy passes. And then we also have a very, very strong um, and very um, visible highway safety office, um, which serves as a model for many other states as far as um, keeping folks safe on the road and ensuring that we're communicating um, properly as far as changes to um, legislation or changes to safety requirements or recommendations, those sorts of things. Um, so while some people may already know that, a lot of people don't know that that's actually, um, DMV in Virginia does a lot more than just driver's license and titles. Okay, so um, I kind of want to go over what our um, our innovation and modernization path has looked like. Um, upon the appointment of our new commissioner, um, we basically reinvigorated a lot of our um, ongoing modernization efforts. And we've undergone some evaluations um, and we've worked extensively um, internally and externally uh, to go through our current legacy systems, our legacy systems, and explore transitioning those into APIs um, and microservices um, and Azure functions, those sorts of things. Um, we're updating our technology as well, um, moving from the older version control of Microsoft TFS for .NET code 
um, into um, Azure DevOps and exploring some options with um, Git and GitHub as far as um, as much as you're allowed to do in an enterprise environment. Uh, we have enhanced our automated testing um, to cover both um, non TN 3270 or non green screen interfaces along with um, those interfaces. So basically um, providing end to end testing and quality assurance for the transactions and the changes. Um, and ultimately that results in um, a more dependable, more reliable experience for both our customers and our employees. Um, so last in this section, um, we're looking at um, going away from a uh, platform um, we, we are moving more towards platform agnostic applications. Um, and so, of course, um, as Arno was mentioning, um, and as was discussed in Dublin, um, the introduction of containerization um, or, or the existence of containerization, um, the ability to run on Linux environments, those all are efforts that um, support, obviously, the platform neutral um, compatibility in that migration. Um, so some of the tools that we use, um, and I personally, I'm a huge fan of most of these, but even at the, uh, as Eric said, the tender age of 33, um, I still have a soft spot for TN3270 and green screen editors. Um, if I could, I would probably still use them in some cases. However, um, I, I, I certainly take advantage of everything that the uh, Natural One IDE has to offer us. Um, we also work with the um, EntireX ACI uh, broker client. We use the software AG SAG designer to um, define our interfaces and integrate the um, interfaces along with the compiled code to link to subprograms and whatnot um, using the broker RPC client uh, on the mainframe itself and in the green screen environment, so to speak. Uh, we rely on database as our um, system of record for database management, um, and all of our applications are written in natural. Um, so some people will say HTML is a programming language, which they're wrong if they say that. Um, so in my case, I can actually say that natural uh, was, natural and database were the first programming languages I learned. Um, so let's see. So we do quite a lot here, and it's, like Eric said, I've been here 16 years. It's been a lot of fun, and I've gotten to see a lot of um, very exciting change and transformation in that time. Um, so um, I'm not going to spend too, too much time on this, but overall, um, our main focus is our customers. Um, our customers, they're the ones that support us, our taxpayers and constituents. They're the ones that pay our salaries and keep our doors open. Uh, so with that, we want to make sure that their interactions with uh, Virginia DMV um, in all of our outlets in any form, um, are they're tailored, they are as customized as they can be, they're personalized to what the customer is actually um, attempting to do, um, because no one wants to go to DMV. We don't come here for fun. <laughs> um, additionally, we're streamlining um, our online offerings and setting up um, mobile appointments and expanding um, the capabilities that we have from a mobile responsive or mobile first responsive design framework aspect. Um, with that, um, that allows us to work on more um, real-time updates and like I said, personalized communications. And we also obtain a lot more information and feedback as far as um, how the customer service is going as far as, um, you know, was your agent friendly? Did you find the transaction easy to navigate or, you know, feedback like that that we wouldn't traditionally get? Um, because of the environment we work in. Um, this allows us to um, basically collect that feedback and then we're able to adapt to it more quickly to implement some of the good ideas that we hear from both um, our folks in the field as well as even customers. Um, so with that, um, a focus, let's see. So again, not to go too long on it, but some of the things that we actually are able to um, do with these integrations and these modernization efforts are um, more security-based and identity security-based. So, for example, we are able to uh, verify the validity of U.S. passports um, when issuing driver's licenses and ID cards. Um, as I said, we're able to issue, issue vital records at DMV. Um, we have several interfaces um, that both go between .NET interfaces um, mainframe or uh, mainframe interfaces, for lack of a better word right now. Um, and 
it's both uh, state, federal, and even local um, as far as like uh, vehicle property taxes and those sorts of things. So it's, it's a more robust integration than I think a lot of people probably imagine when they think about the DMV. Um, but those are all um, integrations that we use day in and day out to ensure that we are issuing secure credentials. Um, we're providing the best service possible to customers and also making, um, making this agency a more enjoyable place to work for the employees actually doing the work. Um, so of course, this is, this is what you'd expect when you make improvements. Um, you have increased customer service and employee satisfaction, reduced wait times um, by opening more, um, more transactions up to be able to be processed online and streamlining those processes. We can actually keep people from having to come to the DMV. So that's great, especially in the post COVID world that we live in. Um, we're all, I don't think we're ever going back to a stacked impact lobby. So, the enhancements that we've made have allowed customers to spend time doing what they actually want to be doing um, versus having to come in and they still obtain the same secure, efficient service that they would have obtained at a branch by physically coming in person. Okay, so now um, the agile piece. So one of the, I wanna kind of slow down a moment and explain um, how DMV has operated um, as far as the SDLC is concerned. Um, when I came in originally, we were certainly a waterfall shop. Um, it, it was very much uh, requirements first, go away and build, uh, test it, and then implement after you get the feedback and final sign off. And after that, um, of course, there are changes, enhancements, bug fixes, and those sorts of things. So after all of the water has fallen, we basically scoop it back up and start all over. Um, and of course, it, it works. Um, however, it doesn't necessarily lend itself to the fast paced uh, world that we live in today and the requirement for um, more agile software development. So with that, um, we've moved from, as I said, more waterfall, waterfall style projects to more iterative development. Um, we've included or we've uh, introduced daily standups um, among some of our scrum teams or our scrum teams. Um, to ensure that there is, um, you know, high visibility as far as tasks go. Uh, there's high, vi high visibility for um, executive sponsors, stakeholders, as well as developers, um, QA analysts, um, even the product owners, of course. Um, we've started documenting more with user stories, um, and then we've begun to factor in um, into these our retrospectives. And our retrospectives are intended, obviously, to Kind of go through and figure out the lessons learned um, in this implementation or in this sprint and how we can improve for the next one. Um, I can say for myself specifically, um, going to a more um, adaptive planning and pair programming and test uh, test driven development um, mindset with um, some of the you know, some of our newer employees um, and even um, longtime employees, um, it's definitely helped build uh, break down some of the barriers. Um, and I'll speak genera generationally for a second, um, as Arno described, um, it's, it's very, very refreshing to see a, you know, a generational, um, there's generational diversity um, in the database natural community that um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in. Uh, so it's great there and um, it definitely breaks down silos and helps uh, form multidisciplinary teams. So while not everyone knows everything, everyone, can at least be proficient enough to um, ultimately accomplish our goal and help us accomplish that. And um, last bit on this, um, we are able to basically factor in our plans um, based on the sprints more quickly, whereas with our waterfall style development a few years back, um, we would learn all of our lessons at the very, very end and then basically start working on whatever was not working and didn't always factor in um, the retrospective aspect of it. So those are things um, that I personally have found a lot of value in. And I would say overall, um, it's the team, the team um, exercises, the team building and communication is probably what I have gotten the most out of as well as a better sense of organization. Okay, um, and as I kind of alluded to, um, 
it's definitely increased our production output um, because, of course, we were going from these waterfall style development cycles lasting, you know, months um, to two to three week sprints. So our product centers knew that they were able to um, kind of plan and, you know, act more agilely or act more agile in their requirements gathering and how they um, feed that back to us as developers to actually implement those changes. So, of course, that touches on ex accelerated feature delivery. Um, we've improved the product quality by working towards um, having automated testing be um, heavily relied on to ensure transaction uptime and system uptime. Um, it's also allowed us to be a little bit more flexible. Um, Agile itself allows us to be more flexible and receptive to changes. Um, because personally, I, I'm not of the mindset that IT is just there to say no. Um, I, I look for a, why can't we do this instead of this is why we can't do this. Um, so with that, um, that's actually led to a few cases of earlier deliveries than expected to customers um, or product owners. Um, we also are able to more um, clearly communicate any risks and it ensures that there's transparency um, on all levels. So, you know, executive level down, um, there's, it, it fosters much more collaborative discussions on it and it gives everyone involved a, uh, a strong um, feeling or a strong view, impression, whatever you may call it, of where this agency is, what our mission is, and what our roadmap is. Um, and I found that people are actually very receptive to it. Um, I, I personally very much enjoy it. Okay, and that's actually the end of my slide deck. Um, so um, I will hand it back over to Eric or Nicole. And if anyone has any questions, I'm just relay those as Eric and Nicole say, and we'll go from there. All right, thank you everyone. I really appreciate your time. Hey, Josh, this is Becky. Thank you. Uh, hopefully my audio is working now. Um, you are somebody back. Somebody tell me, okay, good. Uh, I actually came into the the, off, the rest and office today just for this user group, and who would have known that my home Wi-Fi is better than the office Wi-Fi? But anyway, Josh, thank you. That was excellent. And there was a question, but uh, Garrett jumped on and answered it for us. Uh, it wanted to know if you guys were still on ZOS, Virginia DMV was still on ZOS, or if you'd moved to Linux or the cloud or whatever. And as of right now, you're still on ZOS. So thanks, Josh. I really enjoyed your session very much. Okay, so up next is um, Ellie Cohen from Database and Natural Product uh, Management, and he's going to be talking about how to achieve application high availability in a distributed environment. So Ellie, I'm going to let you share and take over. Okay, great. Thank you, Becky. So I'm just sharing now my uh, presentation. Should work now. Yeah, hopefully you can see it. Yes, all good, Ellie. Go ahead. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, so, thank you, Becky. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Ellie Cohen. I'm the product manager responsible for the natural product uh, product and also nat uh, natural one, natural for Ajax, and the ESM products. So, I will start with my presentation about. Uh, achieving high availability and, and the meaning of uh, what is achieving high availability in our distributed architecture. So first, um, why we need high availability? Uh, everybody wants that the business will continue running even if there is any kind of uh, disaster or if you want just to achieve a better uh, performance that your application will run 24-7 uh, uh, or nearly 24-7 and when you do up Upgrades or updates to your application that you still want to serve the other uh, customers. Looking on the advantages of the distributed architecture, so I see those three uh, big uh, advantages of the distributed architecture. And it, actually, when I built this uh, slide, I was looking at it and said, okay, those, this is a, like a story saying that when you elim eliminate a single point of failure and you detect failure when it occurred, then reliable crossover will allow you to have a maximum of high availability. Each one of these advantages could live by, by itself that uh, with the elimination of single point failure, this means that have more 
instances of your application running. This is very important for the high availability. Even if you have uh, uh, eliminated a single point of failure and you cannot do a reliable crossover, then the reliable crossover becomes the single point of failure. So this could be also something to think about. And, and one thing, which is the last one, is just to do it everything automatically or most of it automatic that to do all this uh, crossover uh, thing when an error occurs. So let's see how this is running and 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 in natural. Uh, so we introduced in October 23 a new product called Natural Availability Server. You will see it as a product called NHA here in this slide. Uh, so here on the, on the right side, we see two backend servers. This means that they can run on a virtual machine or, uh, or containers. And by duplicating them, so we have two instances. This is this means elimination of a single point of failure. We are using state server Redis, uh, which has its own capability of uh, containers, of sorry, of uh, um, high availability. And it could also run on on the cloud. So we use just uh, uh, saving the session data or session context in there. So let's see how this is actually work with natural. So when a user connects uh, to a load balancer, and I will explain more about the uh, new UI that we are introducing with the natural availability server, the load balancer selects one of the backend server. So it connects to the natural high availability server. We have our protocol of uh, uh, we call it the NWO server, which receive the the, um, the transaction and it starts natural in HA mode. Once the session is uh, uh, end or uh, by meaning end is that we have uh, interactive uh, uh, I.O. We save the sh session context in Redis and at the end we terminate the, the session of natural and then it's back to the user. Now let's assume that there is a failure on the backend server on one. Now the load balancer uh, detect that there is a failure and now we are moving to the next server. So it is the second NHA server we uh, uh, can identify that this is not the first request. This means that we first restore the session context from the state server, process it, and then uh, uh, at the end, we uh, terminate the session of natural, and this could uh, continue on and on. And this is uh, something uh, that the high availability or the natural availability server is bringing us to keep uh, the sessions always running. You can, of course, uh, select a mode uh, which is very fam uh, famous in uh, high availability or load balancing architecture to a sticky mode that you continue working on the same server, keeping the session alive to have a better performance or just to do round robin each one. Each uh, uh, transaction will go to a different session, uh, server. Um, I wish to explain about uh, one of the capability with the true story that I had. Uh, I believe that uh, most of us or all of us had the chance to ask for a quote for uh, car insurance. So we start to collecting all the information, sitting with a coffee, drinking the coffee and start entering all the data, collecting the social number and the address and the history of uh, driving and entering all this information and clicking the submit button, hopefully to get the code for the car insurance. And this is what we get. We get an error. And this is why what we call a data entry loss. This means that we enter a data into the application, but the server some, somewhere in the backend was lost and the transaction is dead. And all what we did was for uh, nothing. And then we need to do it uh, back again. So with recoverable data entry, this is what, what of uh, one of the features that the natural availability server brings is that we can recover uh, uh, most of the data. So let's see in the, in the first scenario, the HA mode, this means the high availability mode is off in the natural session. We got the last screen response and we start typing, which is this uh, uh, long purple uh, 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 path. And then when we press uh, PF key or we press enter or click on a button and then we send, we submit it to the uh, server, but now the server is already gone. So all the process is done and we need to restart. With HA mode on, this means that while you type and also in the network area, this means that the 
process on the server did not start it yet, then this is the area that where we can recover. This, if you re remember on the previous slide where I showed the, uh, the path on the recovery from uh, or retrieving the information from the uh, state server, this is where we can act and let the other server to process our request. This could reach out to up to 95% of recovery. In the processing area, it's uh, a bit difficult because of uh, uh, end transaction or backout transaction that we need to handle. We might think of this in the future also to improve some of them, maybe in, in reading mode or uh, some of the read and write mode uh, in the processing. So we might uh, even extend this in the future. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will have a new uh, user interface uh, for the natural availability server. Uh, it is uh, uh, like you had uh, before with the green screen uh, um, uh, application, and this is based on Angular Web UI. Basically, you can bring your own uh, Web UI and use our uh, API or uh, the natural availability server, REST server, sorry, uh, to use uh, 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 your own UI on this. So, in order to achieve uh, uh, this sort of architecture, of course, we need to implement it. So there is some steps in the way that you can uh, stop or or you can do it uh, step by step. We don't recommend to do it as a big bang to go on uh, the the database layer or the application layer or uh, the UI layer. So you can do it uh, step by step on services. So, and I will try to explain on my next slide how this is really working and how you could do the transition and you can decide where you want to stop uh, to, to measure, to see that it is uh, uh, set up for you and then you can move to the next step. Uh, of course, one of the most important thing is to set up your goals to what uh, level of high availability you want to achieve. And I will try to explain this on the next slide and also to show a diagram of uh, the product that's behind of this uh, distributed architecture. So on the right side, I will just show how it uh, uh, look like and, and the name of, uh, of the architecture. On the left side, you see all the benefit that you will get out of a uh, distributed architecture. And each step will just show you uh what I, what you will achieve on uh, on on, um, on the next step meaning uh, the, uh, the advantages so if you have a monolithic application this means you have uh, services on the right side and then you have uh, your online application and you have a single uh, aws uh, uh, file then the only thing that you can achieve with in terms of uh, the advantages is that you can have uh, um, uh, to support in uh, support disaster recovery, this means an active passive way that you can shift your uh, database from or your application from one side to the other side. The next step, if you decide to keep your database as a single uh, file, but you split your application into services, this means using entire RICS and uh, natural as a services uh, option and the online will continue but will be split it into different servers also running in uh, as mentioned before in containers or virtual machines by doing that what you will achieve is that your services are resilient this means that every uh, request that is uh, accepted then it processed and uh, running into uh, the database and then you get back the reason it's that the services are resilient is because usually transaction of services are few seconds and uh, you don't need to keep the session alive so each time it kills the session and start a new session uh, you can do uh, scaling, but not uh, automated. This is why it's 50%. Uh, and when you want to do a upgrade or update, then you can disconnect one of the servers, but uh, you need to make sure that nobody is connected to, do, to this one. So this means that it's actually, you can achieve downtime uh, uh, period, uh, uh, but it's uh, kind of restricted. The next step is to have your AdWords cluster, which is also a product that uh, we have for uh, Linux and cloud. And with having uh, uh, AdWords cluster, which is, uh, um, I think, a great product uh, uh, and, and a mass product, if you wish to have your uh, uh, database uh, information protected, you will have 
database resilient, of course, because now we have the cluster and support, uh, support disaster recovery. The, the disaster recovery was not applied also before because uh, the database uh, was uh, in a single, uh, uh, was also single point of failure, and now you can run your other bus cluster in a different uh, data centers. The next step, which is the last one, then you will add the natural availability server. As mentioned, it's the protocol the NHA here, and we have the state server, and this will complete the list here. Your online sessions are resilient. Uh, data entry loss is the example that I, I, I uh, presented before. You can have auto scale. This means that you can decide based on consumption or uh, user activity to uh, do scale in, scale out. And uh, you can also achieve a minimal downtime during upgrade and upgrade. Just shut down the, the machine and then you will have the ability to do the upgrade to this machine, bring it back and then move to the next uh, server. So as a result of, uh, of that, let's see first the architecture. So on the top uh, uh, area, I will just uh, turn on my uh, uh, laser point. So on the point uh, on, on the top area, we have the session, uh, 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 the online session, sorry, the online session. And on the right side, you have the, the services. The ser both of them are connected to, through a load balancer. On the right side, you will have your API with entire RICs and natural sub programs running, could run on different uh, parts of uh, virtual machines. Uh, so this is uh, the right side, and then the left side, you have the natural have a high availability, the NHA and the natural sessions, and the Redis uh, server to, or the state server to uh, complete that. On the lower uh, uh, side, we have um, the other bus cluster with primary and secondary. Uh, instances. So this is uh, just give you an uh, an uh, high uh, level of the fully distributed architecture, including our product that fully supporting uh, that. So our, with our last slide, so what are the benefits that we are achieving with high availability? So as mentioned, you can do auto scales. It's really could be based on the business demands with high and low peaks to add or remove instances of your servers. And this goes to the right side with the cost of efficiency. If you run on a cloud uh, uh, application, of course, uh, as Arno mentioned, it's cloud, could be also cloud native. You can have a better resource utilization and to uh, achieve some cost saving based on the hardware consumption that you are running on the cloud. Uh, of course, uh, this could also support your DevOps uh, lifecycle uh, deployment uh, that you can have more uh, deployment due to the fact that you achieving uh, less uh, downtime to your application and could do the upgrade on updates during the day. And with uh, the infrastructure, of course, we can isolate errors and detect them as they occur and to have your uh, application more resilient. And that was my uh, last slide. Also save some uh, time for others. Do I have any questions? Ellie, there is a um, question in the chat that says, how well does this scale and perform compared to mainframe implementations? So this is a uh, uh, Linux and, and uh, cloud uh, implementation. This means running on the Linux infrastructure. Uh, in um, in ZOS, we have the Sysplex, which is similar to that, also to keep in the, the, the data and the session context the same as we are doing here. So this is also to have, uh, I would say, um, our application running similar to the Sysplex and also with the natural uh, also. I hope that answered the question. Uh, OK, thank you, Ellie. And I don't I don't see anything else in the chat right now. So and let me just scroll up to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, no, I think that's it for now. Joey, I did see your question or comment about since my audio wasn't working at the beginning, I will try to cover that at the first break or at the end of the set, uh, the user group. I'll go through that again rather quickly. Okay. OK. 
Okay, so um, up next will be um, Helen Kretzman from a &N Support in Denver and Nicole Ritchie, where they will be talking about how to build your IBM and your software AG skills. So ladies, take it away. Thank you, Becky. So we're really excited to share with you um, some of the tools that are available to you to help address the generational challenge you have with the talent, not just on the mainframe, but also with database and natural. Our goal with these tools are to help you um, solve the problem and get your get your customers from, excuse me, your developers from not knowing what they're doing to turning into gods, which many of you who are already experienced are already those gods on the systems. So is everyone see my slides? Cause I'm not able to see them. We good? Okay, I'm gonna assume yes, unless someone tells me not. Um, at the international user group session uh, this past uh, month, we were very fortunate to have a representative from IBM in attendance who shared with us the new IBM Z Explorer program. This special program is really geared toward those who have no experience with the mainframe at all. It's a free tool. My understanding is it's also free for the classes to where they can have direct access to the IBM Z environment and get some hands-on experience learning the basics about the IBM Z mainframe. This tool also ties into the mainframe developer skills depot. Here, you may already be familiar with um, some of the tools available here. A few of the programs I understand are cost-based, but this is a great way to start if you've got better advanced uh, developers here looking to gain some additional skills. They have certifications and badging. Um, all of which also ties back into the IBM Z Explorer program where they also host career fairs and use these badges as entrances into these career fairs that IBM will help host. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Helen, who's actually gonna show you um, some of the offerings in the mainframe skills de depot, as well as share her experience using it. Helen, I'm going to turn this over to you. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Can everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so the reason I had done the um, IBM Z Explore was because I had taken a career break from the mainframe for a period of time and I needed to get back into that skill set. And it was so fun and it was free and it was very accessible to do just, you know, small chunks of focus time. Um, so I really thought it was worthwhile. Um, so this is the home screen here for the IBM Mainframe Skills Depot. And as you can see, um, you can choose different tracks of training. Um, some of them are free and some of them are paid. But going down, you can see you can get some badges as well. Um, there's some interviews, but um, the Z Explore is accessible from here. So if I go to my learning, oh, and the prerequisite is you do need to have an IBM user ID. That's easy to get it. Uh, my learning and completed, show you what I've done. I have completed four badges which are shareable on your LinkedIn and um, profiles. Um, but the Z Explore is here. And I there we go. Um, I have 100, 840 points. Um, so you can get points and you earn badges and points and it's all really fun. Um, and the pathway is fundamentals to advance to extended, but you have to complete the classes in fundamentals before they unlock classes in advanced. Um, so let's see if I click on the fundamentals, you can see these are all the little um, modules you can take. The first one is how to get set up so that you use 
the platform Visual Studio Code to actually log on to IBM's training mainframe. Um, so if you click on the um, Visual Studio Code, there is a PDF that you can download. And let me just go to a different format. That's much more fun to look at. Um, and you get this, you can download, and it shows you the little steps that you have to do, what you have to download, what you have to install, what you need before you begin. You know, it tells you about 45 minutes to get everything downloaded and installed, tells you what to do. Um, so let me show you my Visual Studio Code environment. Um, and they use this um, extension called the Zoe Explorer, which I think is based off of the ZOSMF. Um, utility on the mainframe. So I am actually logged on here to IBM's um, mainframe. And um, I have the JCL here for the, for the training. And so if I go back to to explore and I wanted to show you, for example, the JCL1 course module. You can download the PDF, tells you what you need to do before you begin, that this is a session for 60 minutes. So it's very accessible, very easy. Um, the challenges are challenging. I, I can say that not all of them took me the time they said. Um, there were some times that took me longer or I ran into some problem. Um, there were a few occasions where I had to call my IT department to say, oh, I can't do this or I can't do that. And I had to get a license. I needed a Visual Studio Code license, so I had to get that. Um, but the uh, JCL1 PDF, for example, tells you step one, look for the ZXP public JCL um, module member submit it so let me show you that um, you have to copy this JCL from the public JCL into your own library which <coughs> you get your user ID mine is Z10311 and I should have a JCL data set so I've copied well, I haven't copied this particular one but in there you do the work um, you do what they tell you in the PDF. And then what you do to get your credit and to um, get your points is you submit the check. So this is the validation step. You submit that, it checks your output, make sure you have the data sets with the correct output. You get your points and then it will unlock the next challenge for you. So let's see if I go here <clears throat> and I want to do for example extended um, let's see what it tells me I have the following challenges available to me these are unlocked now so I can do the rec if I can do SMPE um, and you can see my badges if I wanted to earn some badges I have to do some extra extra work. So I think that's all. If there are any more questions, um, Nicole, do you have anything else to share? I sure do. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see any additional questions for you yet, but mm -hmm. I would like to go ahead and share with everyone some tools we have here at Software AG to help you address the learning of needs and skills for Adabase and Natural. So if you've been on um, our uh, previous user groups, you've heard me talk about the three channels that we have for Adabase and Natural training. Um, the first is the channel of our learning portal, which is at learn.softwareag.com. There's a lot of free self-paced training on this site, as well as certifications and badging. And we also offer some live training 
uh, that's customized for what your needs. The minimum required for that type of service is about five, uh, five uh, attendees to get pricing for that personalized experience. If you don't have that many candidates, a good place for you to go is to the Software AG Tech community. There, we have our discussion forums. You can reach out to the rest of the community, find out if someone else needs the training, and kind of create your own group for that more advanced in-person training. Because we recognize that not everyone um, enjoys the, the <laughs> sort of virtual learning. There's different ways of learning, and we can help accommodate that. And then the third area I want to introduce you to is our developer center. From here, this is in essence your one-stop shop. This will get you to the training portal, the, to the tech community, to our documentation site, as well as offer free trials. Let me share with you a little bit more. There is a developer center for both database and natural. Um, as I mentioned here, you're gonna find um, links to some of the high profile trainings, um, the ones that we wanna feature here that might be new. In order to see your complete list though, you're gonna click through the training uh, link that gets you to the learning portal. And there you're gonna find um, a very structured learner's journey that you have the freedom to select and pick which sections you're gonna enter in uh, based on what your individual needs are. So in addition to the learning portal, um, you're also able to access open source tools through the Developer Center. Here we tie into the GitHub, right? And the GitHub uh, shares with you the broad community open source code sharing. Um, this, is, this is a great tool. If you have code you want to share, I know we had a couple of candidates at IUG that talked about things that were really valuable. We'd love to help you get it into this channel so we could also share it with the uh, rest of the community. In addition, um, Developer Center, like I said, is pretty easy to remember. You get access to all the tools that you need. And I really want you to just take away three things, if you can, and that's these two URLs. One, go ahead and see if you can get your folks to build their mainframe skills with the tools provided by IBM. Be sure to visit our developer.softwareag.com site to get access to everything we have to offer. And then reach out. If this is not enough, let us help. We can help with a tailored training plan for your doc, your department, or we could also provide staff augmentation if you find yourself short of talent. So with that, are there any questions for Helen and I about the training programs available to the communities? And if not, I'm gonna hand the floor back over to you, Becky. Well, there were a couple comments. So, first of all, uh, Helen and, and Nicole, great job. Um, someone posted that IBM presented uh, the Z Explore on their Z Day. It was awesome. Thank you, Helen. Says, Thanks, Helen. Uh, Steve Baker said, thank you for sharing. We at California Department of Technology will definitely look into this and share with our customers. Helen then posted the link to get started. It's right there in the chat box. You guys can all go get it. And uh, Nicole, I put in, since Helen had already put the IBM one in there, I put into the chat box a developer.softwareag.com link. Right. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. And so with that, we are coming up to our first break. And that means it's uh, time to uh, do five Amazon gift card giveaways. So I have everybody who registered. Hopefully you're you're on today. I'm going to just randomly pick five names and hope and if you're here, you know, uh come off of mute, say hey, it's me or put it in the chat that yes, I'm here, whatever. Uh the first one is Betsy Bachmersky from state of Delaware. Betsy, are you on? Nicole, you'll check the chat box and let me know if it shows up. If Betsy shows up, uh, types something in there. And yep, she's here. Great, great. Hey, Betsy, nice, nice to virtually meet with you again. OK, so the next one is Donna Edmondson from uh, CPA uh, 
comptroller's office there in the um, state of Texas. Donna, are you with us? A second. Donna, are you with us? I'll give you a second just in case. Go to the next one. Lorraine Latham from state of Minnesota. Are you with us, Lorraine? I've known Lorraine for off and on for a long time. She's here. Congratulations, All right. Lorraine. All right, Lorraine. Good. All right, moving on to the next one. How about, oh, I'm going to mess up the last name. Octavia Taranu from IBC out in the Denver area. Octavia, are you with us? Octavia. Okay, I'm going to wait just a second. If not, I'm going to go on to the next one. How about uh, Richard Jinks from State of California? Richard, you with us? We had us. Yes, a... He's here. All right. All right. So I think that's uh, three, right? Three that have th three that have responded. They're here. All right. I'm going to keep moving because I have two more to give away. Uh, how about, how about, how about, let me, let me, let me, let me shuffle my papers up again. And how about Dan Hyde from uh, state of Vermont? Dan, are you with us? Dan's here. All right, that's four. Okay. Next, the final one for this one. How about uh, Victor Tesuela from State of California? Victor's usually always on these things. Victor, you with us? Okay. Lorraine, did you ever? Oh, Lorraine did pop in. Lorraine popped in. Let me see. Let me go back through my papers here, pick out another one. How about one? Geez, <laughs> this is a coincidence. Joey Chakraborty from uh, Franchise Tax Board, State of California. I know you're on. You've been popping things into the chat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so those are our five. So we're going to take a quick break here. Um, we're going to start back up at 1225. So about 10 minutes from now, we're, we're going to start back up. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you in 10 minutes. So Julie, Julie Rowe from Software AG is up next. Um, presentation on how to modernize natural applications for the web. And Julie, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and get going, go for it. All right. Let's bring it up. Start this up. Okay. Try and get a little picture out of the way there. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good evening, um, wherever you're at in the world. So I'm going to talk about um, how to quickly modernize nat natural applications um, for the web using Natural for Ajax. Um, just a quick agenda. We're going to do an overview of Natural for Ajax, talk about some advantages of using it. Um, there'll be some additional considerations. Um, then I'll show you how to access the demos uh, and developer tools. Um, and then we'll walk through a proof of concept example that we did recently for one of our customers. Um, and then there'll be some contact and reference information at the end. So basically, um, Natural for Ajax um, is a tool that uh, uses Ajax references, asynchronous JavaScript, and XML. Um, and this eliminates the need to reload whole web pages. So when you make changes to that web page, it does not reload the entire page. It only reloads the data that has changed. So you don't see that flash uh, in between with updating the page. Um, so the, the, the development tool allows you to, to transfer those uh, or transform those existing green screens um, into interactive web-based page layouts. You can also create um, uh, custom layouts. Um, it is integrated with Natural One. So Natural for Ajax is a plugin tool uh, for Natural One and used in the Software AG Designer. 
Um, it comes with a developer license for free uh, with Natural One that allows you to go out and create uh, perhaps demos for, uh, for your management or executives to sort of show the value of the tool. So some of the advantages for using Natural Pre Ajax, um, obviously our business users um, are, that are using green screens have probably complained quite a bit about them. Um, so this does definitely improve the user experience and it certainly increases productivity. When you bring in new employees, um, it, it's uh, a little bit easier for them to, to learn with a, a web page that has more descriptive field labels and such. Um, it also enables the natural developers to perform these modernizations. And we'll show you that here uh, in a little bit. Um, just using uh, different statements to process those pages. Um, it's a low risk approach um, to legacy modernization. Um, it allows you to, to use perhaps an agile methodology or iterative development to um, get through the modernization itself. Um, so you can go through steps and show it to users and you know come back and, and you can also deploy various, you know, deploy them as you create them. Um, it does provide tools to convert those existing natural maps. Um, there's no training or experience required um, for the natural developer uh, in JavaScript, um, HTML, or, or style sheets. Um, certainly, if you have uh, that experience, um, you can move into developing the more custom uh, pages. Um, and we do have uh, a comprehensive demo environment that's available. So we'll show you that as well. So additional considerations. So why invest in this change? Well. Um, currently, um, acceptance of mainframe applications and legacy applications are, are part of low-code low modernization trends. Those, those applications are not going away. Um, it works with Linux and Windows. Um, and, and you know, basically, our green screens are, are running out of space. So every time we need to add a field or expand a field um, on a map, um, we run into issues with real estate. Um, then we have to add additional maps or we have to add screens that we scroll to the left or the right. Um, to provide um, that information. Um, so we do have options also for evaluation. So um, the Natural One developers can use the free tool to build um, applications to show value. Um, we are pre-sales uh, systems engineers are available to do demos of the tool um, and support proof of concepts. Um, and professional services is available to assist in, um, in actually working through um, a Natural for Ajax uh, project and deployment. We also have some uh, knowledge transfer um, and training options available. So this is just an example of, of a, uh, a natural for Ajax modernization. You can see that we have over on the uh, left-hand side uh, menus going down um, that side. Um, we have multiple sections of, of pages um, that you can scroll through. Um, various ones down here, you see the buttons at the bottom um, are clickable um, instead of PF keys. Um, we also can generate um, charts and, and graphics um, in whatever uh, in whatever way you need for your business. Okay, so access to the demos. Um, if you go into Natural One and you select uh, Window and Welcome, that will bring up the screen that shows you the installed products that you have and some options around them. So if you see on the right-hand side under Natural One, uh, you'll see some demo applications and you'll see at the bottom there, the Natural for Ajax demos. Um, there's also a Natural for Ajax responsive tutorial. So the tool can be um, used um, with, with, with laptops or, or mobile devices um, uh, to, to support your business needs. So access to the Ajax developer, um, when you go into Natural One, into the designer, um, you can create a local project or use an existing local project to, um, to enable the Ajax developer. So if you right click on that project um, and go down to the enable for Ajax developer, it will then bring up another screen, which asks for, for some additional information. So wherever your web server resides, what that connection is, um, et cetera, you would update that information if needed. Um, I, I've left the defaults on this screen just to show you, but clicking finish then will bring you to, uh, it will create a user interface component folder. And then from there you can go in, you can right click, go into new, and you can come down and select the whatever type of component uh, you want to create. So again, um, our, our team is available to help walk through um, some of the, the parts of this tool or the demos. So just uh, let us know if you need that. All right, so here is a proof of concept that we did for one of our customers recently. 
um, and we just want to walk you through um, the transformations that we did for the various uh, for the various maps. So we did a menu, um, and here are the before and after. So you have the green screen look here, and what it was converted to was a, sort of a tab based menu option um, with drop downs for additional uh, pages. So the benefits here is that um, we can use obviously other than the look and feel. Um, we can use a dynamic, we can create dynamic menus. So if you have security that requires you to uh, only allow uh, certain users certain menu options, um, it can be generated in that way so that their screen only has those options. Um, it has the tree explorer, as you can see under order entry, um, which has a drop down and you can directly uh, link to uh, that additional screen. Um, and that provides the direct navigation to screens via the menu. So we did a data entry screen, which is a very, very busy screen. And you can see there's a lot of abbreviation in some of the uh, field labels, which makes it difficult uh, to train people to use the application. Um, and that was transformed into this web page. So the benefits um, of the data entry screen before and after are, we, you know, we have tabs to replace various screens, um, uh, an interactive map. So if you need to, um, access um, additional information to show on the screen that can certainly be shown. You see that there is a calendar um, drop down here for selecting dates. Um, so uh, it, it will support dynamic field sizes. Um, you can select from a list um, to populate various data fields. Um, and it has also the traditional jump to a lot of customers have um, have navigation within their natural applications. So they type a code that they know and they go directly to that screen. So that is still available over here you see on the right. Um, and, and again, the tabs or the buttons at the bottom are replacements for PF keys. So here's a, 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 a scenario where they had multiple screens scrolling to the right. And the transformation here is to get it onto one page. Um, on, on a web page that allows you then to click the different tabs to go to the different screens versus scrolling left and right. Um, again, this is very helpful to uh, with the real estate that's available on, on the web page. Um, you'll also see, we go to this benefits screen. Um, you'll also see that uh, we do code tran we can do code translation. So for example, here we see division. Um, and instead of it being a code that's on a table on the database, um, we actually pull up the text or a description of that um, so that it's definitely more user friendly and more easy to train folks. Um, so we have uh, grid based tables, as you see down here, and the um, there are interactive help tips. So so rolling over various fields can pull up um, any kind of help text that you might find useful uh, for the, the end user or customers. Oops, back one. OK, browse before and after. So this is just a, a typical browse that we see in a lot of natural applications. And it was transformed uh, into a screen which shows um, uh, header information at the top. It has tabs for the different uh, scrollable areas. But you see here that you can scroll through uh, the various items uh, in, the, um, on, uh, in the screen, in the browse. So um, additional. Let me go back one. There we go. Missed that one. Okay. So as I said, controls and scrollable areas are a big um, are, are a big benefit to um, transforming these browse uh, screens. So some additional capabilities um, that that uh, you you would allow you to do with Natural for Ajax is one is PDF. We have a lot of customers interested in being able to generate PDFs from Natural, um, and there has not been a great way to do that um, in the past. Um, but here. Uh, we have the capability with Natural for Ajax to generate PDFs from what is uh, information on the screen. Um, we can create custom PDFs that have graphics and barcodes, QR codes, that type of thing. Um, and it also gives you the ability to uh, upload data and uh, make calls. You can make calls to external support. So if there are web services or APIs out there for, for say, validating addresses or um, calculating shipping costs or, or you know, uh, including links to, to tracking detail for shipments, um, that type of thing can uh, also be um, used um, in creating these pages. So the last thing really is that, that um, not all screens have to be transformed. And this is where we uh, can say that this can be um, an effort uh, that is uh, iterative. Um, we can transform the pages that we um, find necessary 
um, to make them more user friendly, but we also don't have to do any transformation. We can simply out of the box um, provide via the natural web IO um, the screen, the same screen as the same look and feel. There are no changes to this, and, and that is something that can do very, be done very quickly. So when a user is using the application, they can um, basically have a similar look and feel to, to the or a similar access point and a, a similar look and feel to the screens. And some may be enhanced in the way you saw the previous pages, um, and the rest of them may stay green screen looking until you are ready to move forward with transformations um, to make them more customized there. So just went all over all that. Um, existing screens are registered, or can be rendered in the browser. Um, then the style sheets can be modified to change fonts and colors and, and add you know, logos for your business. And, and PF keys can be transformed um, into those clickable links. So with regard to development um, from a coding perspective, as I said, um, the natural developer um, would be able to pick up um, this, type of, uh, this type of effort. Um, and the difference from green screen to natural for Ajax, you see here, uh, we use currently input using map for those green screens. You would use process using page for natural for Ajax. Um, decide on first PF key, for, exa for example, would be decide on first event um, when using natural for Ajax. Um, and they are defined variable lengths on green screens, and you can have dynamic variable lengths with Ajax. So key takeaways for this, um, truly it, it improves business user experience and it certainly improves, pro, improves productivity. Um, the, the great thing that I love is that it provides natural developers the ability to support modernizations. Um, and additionally, you know, it provides a low risk phased approach to legacy modernization um, and can be done very quickly. So finally, um, just some contact and reference information. So for professional services support, you can contact either myself or Mark. Um, if you are looking to get a demo or do a proof of concept, you can reach out to Patrick. Um, and then I just included a couple links for uh, reference. Uh, we do have a, a training course for uh, Natural for Ajax and also a link to the documentation. If you're looking to uh, set up the demos, there are a few steps um, that you would need to take. So um, the documentation does line that out, or again, um, our teams can uh, coordinate with you and help you walk through that process. All right, that's it. All right, Julie, thank you. And again, mm -hmm. these um, PowerPoints will be made available to you um, sometime in the next few days. And so all those links will be working. So don't worry about jotting them down. Uh, we'll be delivering those uh, really quick, okay? So up next is Kurt Hansen from Database and Natural Support. And, you know, Kurt is always doing a great job presenting for us. And so, Kurt, I'm gonna let you talk about your natural APIs and other hints. And sorry, I think I took away your screen share. Uh, I jumped to too soon, Becky, no problem. And you can hear me, okay? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so we're gonna just spend a couple minutes uh, talking about APIs, specifically those delivered in the SysEXT application. So we're gonna talk about some object types and their purpose. I'm gonna show you a demo, I'm gonna go online, uh, some of the more common ones, some you might find uh, interesting that you might use. Uh, some of those that when working with global support, we might be asking just from information how to quickly get that using these APIs. Uh, you know, little hints, online versus batch. And then there is a sibling application so, called SysExtp that does provide um, some APIs, in this case for ZOS only, but a lot of people aren't familiar with this, and then just uh, some tips at the end. So SysExtp provides supported, supported APIs used for accessing and possibly modifying data or other services that, not, that are not accessible by natural statements. So that's the key there is we're providing some supported code that uh, you may use that aren't provided you know, out of the statements, manuals, or using na uh, normal natural coding. So what are the three uh, deliverables for each of the APIs? Well, we provide, uh, well, first of all, the um, <clears throat> syntax is USR followed by some numeric values and N, P, or T. The N will be a catalog object, and that's the actual API subprogram. As a P provided, and that is the source 
that is going to invoke the in or the actual catalog object. And you can see and use a test or possibly do some modification. And then there is a T uh, module that's provided, which is the text of the object. And we'll take a look at that. That gives you more information on what the intent of the API is and keywords and how to find it and how to interface with it. So the SysEXT APIs are available on ZOS, Linux, and Windows. Most are shared across platforms. Some are only unique to the specific platform. So if you have both and you went to the list, you might see uh, a little bit uh, of a difference in the list of them. So let's go ahead and do a demo. We all know how demos work on these, but uh, should be OK. So this is complete. I'm going to go ahead and sign on to natural uh, 922 in this particular case, and this will come into play here in a minute. I'm going to do an override, put an ETID of Kurt. So once I'm in natural, I'm going to go into sysext, and I'm going to pass it a value. This is in the documentation. We'll take a quick look at it. But what this is going to do is uh, format the screen a little differently by saying second it's going to bring up the category on the screen of the different um, APIs that are available. Now, there are many of them, and you're probably sort of going through the list, and you don't get a lot of information really here from the description. One of the first places to start is you might enter an asterisk here in the keyword, and that'll give you a list of all the different keywords, and we'll look closer in each of the uh, USRs. Some of those that people may not be uh, familiar with are these right here that talk about modifications. So if we look at, say, for instance, uh, 922, which we just released, and these two particular um, APIs were modified with natural 922. If you're using those, you might go look to see what those modifications were. So a little bit of helpful hints. Go back here, we'll look at I, some of the other ones are what is new, what's been introduced with the latest version of Naturals, always evolving. So let's look at Natural 922. For instance, we've introduced three new USRs, one dealing with RPC, one with data handling, and one concerning the natural environment. So what we can do here, for example, we can issue a T. If you remember, that was one of the modules that are provided. So if we enter a T here, we get to take a look to see what is this particular interface about, we can see the different keywords on how could we have found this by typing it in. Will it come in the list if you use security or any of these other keywords? Um, looks like there was a previous version, USR 4011, and now an updated version, 9205. And then we give uh, some information concerning what the function is of that particular um, API is, parameters that are being used, et cetera. Just information in general about the API. Um, I'd like to point out this particular user exit, 9207. For those of you who might have INPL or have natural 922, just the base INPL uh, active, you won't see this user exit. This user exit, or I say user exit, API, uh, was actually introduced with natural 922 service pack two. It was the result of a feature request that was put in by a customer saying, hey, we'd like to have a user interface to the dump zaps um, functionality that's in natural. And so that was developed and it was actually introduced again at a service pack. We weren't going to have to wait until natural 923 is introduced or released in October. So just uh, information there that it's always changing. Um, so I'm going to put a different keyword in here. Let's do parameter. Here's all of the um, APIs that deal with the natural parameters. One of them that we might ask you to do if you're working with um, global support is the natural profile profile parameters um, that are being used um, at, in the current session. So natural startup parameters. So not everybody obviously links up the natural parameter modules every day, but maybe you have a need to go in and you're gonna change one of your parameters. You link it up and you're like, oh, did I do everything correctly? Am I now picking up that new parameter? What's the best way to do is log on to that transaction, come into sysext, execute this user exit, and then you will see the parameters that are being used that were linked up that are in the natural parameter module. And one thing I wanna point out here is right there, ETID equals quote, 
space quote. That is in the natural parameter module. That's how ETID parameter is coded. And we'll go down through here. You'll see all our NT files, some zip parameters, DB2, VSAM, et cetera. Come back out. A second one that you might want to execute uh, also is the dynamic. So for instance, a lot of people, if you've inherited a system and you just log into a natural transaction has a front end, there may be based on a user ID or some other criteria, a profile parameter being invoked. So dynamically, some of those parameters are being changed. So if we look here, and there you go, you can see that on this particular transaction, there was one dynamic override Again, the one that I enter, ETID equals Kurt. So the combination of those two USRs, those APIs, can give you what is my current environment? Okay, what is the base? What is in the natural modules? Is it everything that I thought it was? And secondly, in this particular environment, are we doing any dynamic overrides? We've gotten um, tickets in before where people saying something's not looking right, and we found out, unbeknownst to them, that there was actually a profile parameter being picked up and some of the natural parts were being modified at execution time. Okay, so let's jump back over. I know that was a little quick, but I think you get the idea. A lot of information, how you can go through and try to find maybe one that'll be useful for you. So recommended APIs when working with global support. So we just talked about 8203, reads the parameters defined in the parameter modules. Uh, we showed 4004, how you can read, uh, retrieve dynamic uh, uh, profile parameters may be done with dynamic overrides. There's ones on getting last in error information, the last database call, and then of course we looked at the one at getting information about zaps, and again this is an interface to the dump zaps command that I think many of you are probably familiar with. Help the API, so if you go back in just to give you an idea in a keyword if you type in RPC you will see all the different um, APIs that deal with uh, natural RPC, and it may save you some coding, or you might be able to leverage some of these. This right here, keyword equals time, um, comes in very handy on converting store clock or working with time values within natural. And then some list commands, so list and libraries, objects, DDMs, et cetera. So it, again, just gives you some useful um, APIs that you might uh, be able to leverage. Suggested handling of the APIs, and this is this is out of the manual. Um, we'll jump over there in a minute, but if you want to use these natural APIs, they're contained in the library CCXD, as we had seen, and then you should perform one of the following steps. So the way to, to do those is you could just define the system library CXT in the system file F9 as a step lib, for your user library, so that way nothing has to move or change. You want to use the API exactly as we deliver it. You could just step live to it and then invoke it. You could copy the API to the, the library system in uh, system file FNAT. Thus, you only need to check a single library for APIs when upgrading your natural version. And again, this goes back to one of those keywords that talked about modified with NAT922. You could go back and say, well, are any of the, uh, those that I have listed here, have they been modified? And then there's a couple of other ways you could do it, not recommended, um, but they are there. An API can only be used in the natural version, which it was delivered. So strongly recommend to store the APIs only in the FNAT system files. When we say version, like going from natural eight to natural nine. A little hint here, when using natural API in batch, okay, many of the APIs, like the ones that uh, I showed today, um, have a menu. So you have to take that into consideration. Here's a little hint here for the one that uh, I showed that uh, demonstrated how you can dump and display the natural parameters. You could actually run it in batch. So if you relinked your natural batch nucleus, you wanted to see, hey, did everything, does everything look correct? Did I, am I picking up what I think I changed? You can run that in batch. And um, here's a sample to where we've actually, oh, well, step back for a second. We've gotten, um, a question many times in the support saying, hey, I need to count how many lines of code I have in this F user or, or in this particular uh, natural uh, application uh, for whatever um, reason for that. And we actually have an example program that is invoking three different USR um, APIs. 
and it is available and I'll just click here and hopefully everything works right um, I'm gonna go out to get support so here it is if you go out to the knowledge base uh, right now and just type in in the search counting application source lines you'll pull up this um, KB article and we actually prov provide a text file that's in sys obgh unload transfer format so you could do a sys obgh load load this program up into um, your system and execute it and see if this is possibly uh, a little quick uh, user program that might be helpful. Okay, I mentioned that that SysExt actually has a sibling called SysExtP. Not as robust as SysExt. There's not a menu driving, but if you go into library SysExtP and do a list, uh, like a list asterisk, you'll get a list of all of these programs here. And there will also be one called index, which will list. But these are specific to ZOS in the example that I uh, am giving here that apply only under certain TP monitors. So for instance, executing a TSO command, you want to do a write to write message, a WTO to the operator. There is an API that we're delivering that will help you out in doing that. Okay. And then uh, to kind of wrap it up in the natural utilities manual, you'll actually will find a lot of great information concerning uh, 6EXT and how to invoke it. Up, oh, there we go. Uh, come down through here again, the, as a reminder of the different objects that we deliver, how to invoke it. When I, I came in, I said SysEXT second. And then information concerning how to just navigate. There are some direct line commands that can be used, et cetera, and make it a little helpful. The uh, database and natural ideas portal. Again, uh, a number of these USRs were all uh, driven by request from the customer community. So if you come out here into the database and natural ideas portal, you can see for all the different products, just not natural. There are change enhancements, feature requests. You can vote on them. You can go out there and say, wow, somebody already opened up one. I was thinking the same thing. Then vote on it. Add your two cents in there. And the way you navigate to that, I'm logged into Empower here. It's just down here under feature requests. And then the database and natural ideas portal is how you can get to it. And then I, I put in here cumulative fixes because again, cumulative fixes, you know, we have two different ways, or actually there's, there's probably there's three because we actually do load library, load module replacement at time, but mainly it's zaps, which you're all familiar with probably, but we also have cumulative fixes and that's where we update the natural based code that we deliver uh, for release of natural. And um, I'm sure many of you have navigated here before and then cumulative fixes for ZOS. And again, you could just come in here and type in natural and then boom, come down here. The latest cumulative fix for natural 922 was cumulative fix three released a couple of weeks ago and you can download it and apply it. Okay, well, that's not it. And I think that was it. So Becky, I think right. I'm ahead of schedule here. Although, you, you actually, Becky, if I can do a public service announcement, if I have a you couple, have I have an extra you minute. Have you have plenty of time. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, I want to jump back over to Empower. So this was actually brought up, and I thought about this when Arno was asking, answering the question concerning um, the split out of the business line, like the web methods business line. He mentioned it included entire X and app links. Well, we that there was an update and there was an announcement that there was a new incident management portal that was introduced on Monday morning of this week. So very timely. So if you signed into Empower and you go out to the incident management portal, you're going to see there are two options now and they are completely separate uh, systems on the back end for us here in global support. Uh, the one that you're used to for database and natural, of course, in Eris, Alphabet, and Internet of Things, which is Cumulosity, you would enter the inc this inter incident management portal. You can see the background, Software AG, 
We actually say here, you know, you're in the right place. This is where you're going to go find your incidents that you've opened up that are in there, et cetera. But we've also introduced a similar incident management portable, but for web methods and stream sets. And for this user group uh, audience, if you have entire X or app links, you will need to go into this incident management portal to open up uh, the respective product incidents from here on. And you will see that it does look a little different, the background, and then it will specifically say, this is the portal for entire X and app links. So um, this is step one in preparing our internal systems for eventually those uh, that uh, business units, so the web methods, stream sets, including entire X and app links to basically move to IBM um, here at some point in time. Okay. All right, thanks, Kurt, that was great. And I must have uh, scared everybody. Everybody's finishing either on time or early today. <laughs> I was keeping going to the clock. And I historically talk fast, so. Yes, yes. But thank you, <laughs> Kurt. Uh, there, was, there were some really good comments uh, about your session. Um, you know, they love the PAR module display, love the level of detail in these functions. Uh, Ellie posted, just now posted something, uh, user rights at sample in our AHA IDEA portal will be released October 2024. So um, let me sh share my screen with you guys uh, here. Okay, so up next is um, Data Unleashed, Virtualization and Synchronization for Mission Impact by Donnie and Demos. So I'm going to stop sharing, guys. If you want to go ahead and share your screen and come off of mute, you're on. Okay. So thank you, Becky. This, uh, can you see my screen? I make sure. Yes. Yeah. Go okay. ahead. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. I'll say morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, my name is Donnie Bierman. I'm the product manager for Connex. And um, Demos Economos will be joining me and he'll be doing the uh, demonstration part. So I'm a talker, so different to Kurt. I'll try and do this fast. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in and um, get going. So I, I guess the, the, the first question is the need for data access and integration. And I am pretty sure in your organization you've come across or you are seeing many of this. So first one, the real-time data access. We see newer applications being developed. They want access to data. Some of that data is whether it's in a legacy mainframe or whatever other system and they want real-time data now and you know the preferred access method is sql so uh, that would be the one one thing the other is new applications uh, developing it similar to the real-time access in this case we just have a new application i have a customer that developed an application um, for car part management they run all of that on vms uh, they've developed a new version that runs all on Windows, but they have a time transition period and they need to access the <clears throat> previous application and system from the new environment as well. So uh, new application historical data. Data silos, I, I think we, we, we are all from... Um, a time era, and I'm not going to add age to this, but I'll, you know, from a time era where we developed and we all developed applications in the departments or divisions or groups that we were in, not necessarily concerned about um, sharing that across organizations um, to to be to be used. So uh, data data silos are very common. You know, it could be a cultural thing as well. Um, I remember the days when I started as a DBA, nobody could touch my data. I didn't realize it was my data, it was the customer's data, my customer. I was just the DBA, the custodian of the data. Then we have migrations, and I'll I'll put rehosting and migrations under this. In general, um, <clears throat> you'll see that under one of my other points as well, uh, where you have a new application or a different platform or different technology, and there's a transition period that you will go through 
where you need data in, in all areas. The other one is data warehouses and data lakes. Um, I'll talk about cloud in a second, but there is this uh, drive to cloud analytics because it really is the most powerful platform. So we'll, we see a lot of historical data warehouses or data lakes being modernized and moving to the cloud. So, you know, you have that need as well. Then cloud analytics, which I just mentioned, it is it is the platform for cloud and for analytics is, is the cloud environments like the uh, snowflakes and so forth. Uh, um, best cost performance um, and security and centralized data options out, out there. So we we see customers moving in that direction. And then COTS package applications, which to me are similar to new application development. The the only difference here is, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the the you you might be implementing a COTS package. It might only cover some or all of the data of pre-existing um, or historical applications, and you need access to that data, whether it's in real time or in a synchronized fashion. So. Let's first talk about the, the real-time access. Um, in this case, I, I just going to use the example, and this is actually, Demos, uh, Demos will show some of this, not necessarily all of this, but um, if you're interested in me doing this or any of the pre-sales engineers doing this, we can show you this. I have customer data residing on vSAM, some order data residing in an Adabas, and I have product information on the SQL Server. So step one we implement all our database connectors. So these are the connections or, or the means whereby Codex connects to the database and provides us SQL access to those, those data sources. So to the VSAM and database, you say, well, Codex SQL Silver already has that. But yeah, but let me add to this. Because I have Codex in place, I can now virtualize. I can have a query against a view that will bring back data from vsam adabas and sql server in one query so there's the example if you look at uh, customers that's written purplish or purple color that's the first few columns that you see that comes actually from the vsam data set the order information the reddish columns actually comes from an adabas and then the greenish colored um, columns actually comes from a SQL server. So what's the key factor here? I can access data across platforms, across databases. I can create a single view of my data, which I can then utilize in a reporting tool um, and so forth. So good example for this is a bio, large biotech uh, company. They had five different data sources. I'm just going to talk in general here, and you can read the details. But they needed to authenticate people to validate the employees for access to either whether it was intellectual property or physical access or or lab, you know, whatever. They they needed to ensure that. Now this was done with a data warehouse, which brought in latency. So if you started a new role today, you could only get access tomorrow. And they could also only track you tomorrow for that. The solution was they did um, virtualization using Connex, and uh, they created a single view, a single meta model with data from across all five of these disparate systems in the back end. And it was now real time access. They could there and then, the moment they you you're given access, you have access to to that environment. No wait time and audit trails were also then immediate and determining who was accessing what at any given time. So the next part, you, you saw when I when I said what's driving this data integration, virtualization stuff, is data movement. Um, that always stays with us, and there's really for us in the Adabasta natural world, and this is where I'm focusing a little bit, there's really two uh, means of doing that this real time and under real time we're talking about Adabas event replicator and I'm going to specifically address for LUW. Um, most of you are also familiar with the Adabas event replicator for ZOS, not talking about either of them, <clears throat> but that is replication of transactional data in real time. What do I mean by that? 
I'm moving data changes as they happen. I'm not waiting for anything. And then there's near real time. And that is, I refer to as data synchronization, and you'll use Connect's data sync for that. It's time and event driven or schedule your synchronization. And I want to put an exclamation mark or underline event scheduled and not only time. It supports any database that Connects can connect to. Uh, anyone that we have installed, the Connects database adapter can be used as a source or as a target. We can move the data from the one to the other, or we can just determine what changed. Transformation and lookups are possible. When I talk about the use case, you'll, you'll hear an example of that. And then your databases can either be your destination or even your source for that matter, could be on premises or a cloud database as a destination. So let me quickly go through the, the semi-technical slide here. In this case, I just have Adabas mainframe, LUW, and let's say vSAM on the other side. I have the database adapter, so I have standardized SQL access to them. Because we have Connex, we have a virtual view, and I can now put in data sync and transformation. And why do I do it in this order? Guess what? That virtual view that I created of the data spanning different platforms and different technologies, I can synchronize that to a destination. So it's not a one for one. I can create a user view, a virtual view of my data, and I can use data sync to synchronize that to a destination. And I can do transformations. So I just need the database connectors that will connect me to either my on-premises data source or databases or destinations, or I can go to any one of the cloud environments. So a good use case in this case, um, some government agency, uh, they had a replication process whereby they would drop all the tables at the destinations and rerun it every night um, from the origin and populated it. This job ran for hours. That one unique case where they would, for the one table, they would do a lookup to determine a date range. And using that date range, they would then only replicate that one specific table or data from that table. And it was about task and jobs that were done and when they were completed, etc. So the solution that got implemented was Connex Data Sync. We just kept on updating all of these other tables during the course of the day. They figured out when was low performance times and we moved data, only the changes, only the changes from the source to the destination. And now that job at night only had one task to do. It, it again, using data sync and transformation, we did the lookup, we determined the, the, the date range and we found the records that was needed and moved it to the destination. So what do we offer? A variety of data sources, 150 plus databases. What do we need to address? Advanced data analytics, business intelligence, etc. I'm not going to go through every option in that. And how do we achieve this? First data access, we keep your security and we can enhance it, metadata management, and you have your database adapters. Once we have that in place, you can virtualize, and I can then also move the data. Um, we can do synchronization. If it's Adabas, we do replication. And then we can also just provide you with a change data, so change data capture. That's it. Now I'm going to hand over to Dimas. So I will stop sharing. And Dimas, if you are ready, you can jump in. Sure. Thank you. Oh, let's get my slide. Okay. Hello everyone. My name is Dimas Economakis, and I will be doing the demonstration part of our Connex data sync and virtualization products. Let's start the demonstration by signing into our web interface to our Connex data administration tool. The Connex data dictionary or CDD is a comprehensive metadata repository that manages and stores detailed information about the data tables and fields within accessed databases. The CDD 
is an essential component acting as a centralized repository for metadata about data structures within a system. Another way to think about the data dictionary is to imagine that you are traveling from Orlando Airport and want to get to Disney World, but you've never been there before. The best thing to do is to use a map to get a representation of the location and the roads that you will be taking to the Magic Kingdom. By using the map, we are not concerned about who built the roads, what material, materials they used, etc. In the same way, we can map our physical data with the Connects map, which we will call a Connects Data Dictionary, or CDD. This map or definition helps us get to the data without having to be concerned with such things as EBCDIC to ASCII conversion, packed fields, etc. In this demo, I'm going to be using two database files, the employees file and the vehicles file, that have been supplied with database for over 30 years. In the CDD, we have mapped up to our two files on, a, on the mainframe in Germany. We've also mapped to a SQL Server database that is located on AWS EC2 instance. The great thing about Kinex is that we could map to over 150 different kinds of databases and use the same process and procedures to access the data on any one of these databases. We have selected the ADA to SQL CDD we previously created. And as I mentioned, we are mapped to two mainframe databases with two different files. As you can see there, we mapped to the employees file, database 137, file 71. And just a few things on this screen. We have table properties that tells us about the table, table columns, table indexes, and table security. I will touch on those in a bit. Let's also take a look at the vehicles table properties. The record length is 1122. The database is 238, and the file number is 14. Now let us take a look at the table columns for the vehicles file. Here we see that we have the column name, native type, SQL type, etc. Connects does the mapping for you automatically. Once you ingest the file layout from database using sysobgh or another import mechanism, Connects will set this up for you and do the default mapping to the SQL data types. You can override some of these um, if you decide that you want to have a different in in interpretation of the field for a valid business reason. But 99% of the time, the mapping that Kinex does for you is, is great and good, and it do you don't need to make any changes to the field mappings. The Table Security tab allows you to define security on files and fields. You could restrict what a user or group of users can do with a specific file, you could even restrict a specific column from updates or deletes. Now that we've set up our Connects data dictionary, the next step is to use our data dictionary to synchronize data that's on the mainframe to our SQL Server instance. Data sync is particularly helpful in environments where data from mainframes needs to be continuously synced with modern databases cloud services or analytic platforms. For example, a financial institution might use data sync to synchronize transaction data from a mainframe to a cloud-based analytics platform for real-time fraud analysis. Similarly, healthcare organizations could use data sync to synchronize patient data from a mainframe to various clinical applications to ensure that every point of care has the most current information. This not only enhances operational efficiency, but also helps in maintaining data consistency and accuracy across different data platforms and business applications. For our next use case, I'm going to demonstrate how we're going to synchronize data that's on our mainframe in Germany to a SQL table that is installed on an Amazon EC2 instance. The first step is we select tables and then we click on the file or table that we want to synchronize from. Next, you are presented with a synchronization type. You have automatic, incremental update, full reload and incremental only. These are options that you could use 
but your best bet is to stick with automatic. However, for today's demonstration, I'll be using full reload where I will be synchronizing all the data that's on my database vehicles file to my SQL server vehicles table. The synchronization process runs in the background and after we press refresh, we can see that the vehicles table has been reloaded from the mainframe database file. We synchronized or moved over 798 rows or records and the process took 14 seconds. To validate that Connect Data Sync has correctly updated our SQL Server table, we navigate to the SQL Server database in SQL Server Management Studio, select our table, and then select the top 1000 rows in the SQL table. And as you can see there, the data has arrived on our SQL Server instance, and that's that is from the mainframe in Germany. Another way to utilize mainframe data is to use a tool like Microsoft Power BI to view data from a mainframe using the Connects Data Dictionary. In this case, I've set up a connection to Connects and I've set up a relationship between the employees file and the vehicles file. It's a one-to-many relationship. On the left hand side, you can see that light blue color, that's the employees file. And on the right hand side, we have data from the vehicles file. Now let's switch gears and switch back to our data that's resident on the mainframe. We have a natural screen that reads the vehicles file and I'm going to modify this a record on the mainframe and then synchronize back to Power BI and I'll show you how quick and easy that process is. In this case, I'm going to change the make from Toyota to Adabase and Natural and the model forever and make an update. Then I'll resynchronize in Power BI and you'll see that the update is immediately available. If we switch back to our Power BI screen and next we will press the refresh button and now it's running in the background and pulling down all the data from the mainframe to the Power BI screen. You could equally as well have got the data from the SQL Server instance, but I wanted to show you how easy it is to use mainframe data to do analysis using Power BI. Once the Power BI refresh process completes, you can see the updated record now reflects as the first row where the make is database and natural and the model is forever. Next, we switch gears to data virtualization. Data virtualization allows you to create a logical view of multiple connect sources. For example, this level of abstraction allows you to combine an database file with a SQL Server table and present a combined view as a single table or file. In this example, we've created a logical connects view of the mainframe employees file and a SQL Server vehicles file. The two data files are logically linked via personnel ID. In this example, I selected only the relevant fields from each file to present a customer's view of the data. By using user views, access to mainframe files can be simplified and the complexity of the relationship between two files or multiple files is abstracted away from the user. In addition, all the usual security rules can be applied to, to the user view. In this case, I'm using a tool called Infonaut to demonstrate how we could use the user view. However, you could be using Power BI, SQL Server Management Studio, or any other tool to access the Connects user view and also to access mainframe data via Connects. That is the end of the demo. Back over to Dani. Mm, thank you, Demos. Let me quickly get back to uh, to my slide, and there we go. So, have three takeaways for you.
Oh, Annie, you might be on mute. Oh, I thought I'd done that. Thanks, Dimas. So, like I said, and you didn't hear three key takeaways. Um, we 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 have so many times said to the customers, "Oh, here's your data. You want another copy? Here's your data." Overcome that challenge, get real-time data access, and you can then virtualize across multiple databases on multiple platforms. So that's my first takeaway that I that I want you to leave you with. The second one is to enable your business to moving data to and from Connex for any connected database. So um, in the in the questions, I I try to answer some of the the questions that I saw, um, and in short. Any database that I can connect to, I can move data to that database or I can move data from that database. So I can go and determine what changed and then only move the changes to the new destination. And the third and last thing is let your business need define the frequency for data synchronization. Look, there's a place for replication, the real time transactional stuff, but then there's definitely a place for data synchronization. Don't tie it to only it can run every hour, five hours or whatever. You might have a situation where you only need it under certain conditions, maybe a batch job finished. And after that job is finished, you want to then synchronize the, the two environments or, or any similar thing. So you can make it event driven synchronization. So that's my three t t key takeaways. And with that, Becky, we are handing back to you. OK, Donnie and Dimas, thank you very much. And there were several questions in the chat box, and uh, they've been answered. I, I've been kind of keeping an eye on that. Seems like they've uh, all been um, answered. But if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Uh, just before I introduce Kurt for the last session is stick around after the next session, which is the Adabase DBA 101. Stick around because I will cover the um, the roadmap and a couple other things that I, I covered this morning, but you guys couldn't hear me because of the internet connection here at the office. Uh, and we're going to give away some more Amazon gift cards. But the last but not least session today is Adabase DBA 101, how to deal your DD cards with Kurt. So Kurt, it's your, your game again. Okay, thanks, Becky. So what we're going to look at here is for, uh, we talked about generational change, I think, in a couple of the different presentations. There's new DBAs possibly on the call, and maybe just a refresher for those who've been around working with uh, Adabase for some time. And if I can get this to go to the next. So what I'm going to cover is just some helpful hints from global support on where to locate Adabase session information that'll be useful when debugging an issue on ZOS. Um, so we're going to talk about the database nucleus. You know, what are you going to see in the JES log? What DD statements does the nucleus use, including license keys, which I actually talked about in a previous um, user group session? What dump DD name do I need to have? And uh, I should step back that this is specifically going to be discussing database on ZOS. So which dump DD name? How does it come out? Uh, I'm not getting the, the dump that I think. Uh, why would that be? A detailed look at DD print. And then we'll talk briefly on utilities and then um, a little self-serving here, but what diagnostics should be included when an database incident is open? So first of all, what does the JES log tell us? A lot of great information, anywhere from the license check, some important information. I imagine almost all of you are running your production databases with protection logging for that particular session. Right off the bat, it will tell you that protection log is active and importantly, what session number you're using. That'll come in really important if you're in a disaster recovery scenario where you have to restore the database, run ADARES to regenerate. Um, any add-ons or other products like Delta Save, um, review, replication, messages are going to be found in the JES log. Um, most importantly, database is active. Oh, excuse me, went back there. Uh, other things, another add-on, database encryption to basically just verify in this particular case, a to b the associated data both encrypted using database encryption. Other things to look at on the startup. And uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to point out is uh, an example, if you ever see an ADA in 58 message, 
in your nucleus startup, it meant the previous session ab ended or did did not uh, finish uh, cleanly. In this particular case, uh, during auto restart, we detected a buffer flush and we have a start record and we did not find an end record. If you ever get an A to N58 mes message, do not um, wait, uh, call global support because uh, if we didn't come through auto restart cleanly, there could be issues. Very, very rare cases, but you don't want to wait too long. You can go, uh, if the longer you wait, uh, the worse things could, could get if you see an A to N58 message. Another one you may see is an A to N 5A message. And what that means, you for whatever reason, A to base didn't come down cleanly. It came back up. We came through auto restart, came through the buffer flushing. Everything was cool. But when we came through auto restart, these files in the list had open transactions. So maybe keep an eye on those files moving forward. But those were the ones that were um, being uh, updated at the time. Now in the JES log, you're going to see there are a lot of different messages. They're all prefixed. Like what is what is an R ARB? What is ADAF? Uh, it is, and again, being in support, I point to the documentation a lot. But in the documentation, we actually do have the prefixes that go through all the different add-ons. You know, what does it mean? What does an ADAF mean? Well, it's event replicator messages that are coming out in the database nucleus. There's handshaking going on, and it might be something to uh, review and become familiar with. But it comes down through here, and you can see all of the different prefixes to the messages that you'll see in the JES log. Additionally, you may see other products are up and running. And here's just an example of entire network. In this particular case, Adabase came up with TCP IP set to yes, and it's doing a handshake with uh, entire network and the directory server. And you might see net messages up and running. In that particular case, uh, I won't follow the link, but they're uh, documented in the entire network messages, not in the Adabase messages. So uh, most beginning with an A, D, F, some are all in Adabase, but there might be some in another product's uh, messages and codes. So what DD statements does the Nucleus use? And again, this is just a refresher. Of course, um, associator, data and work, the protection logs, the command logs, and, and very important, DD print, what we're going to write out to. And um, I'm going to do a little bit of bouncing around here in this presentation. There we go, pull up the documentation. Um, here's the DD statements. And what's really nice in the documentation, it will tell you there's different notes at the bottom um, to go down and will tell you uh, based on like, what is a work data set? What is it used for? What are the different parts of it? What you can expect and working with it. Recovery aid, there was a DDR log or DDR1 data set if I remember right in my example there, but the documentation does spell out what each are used for. Database sessions parameters, one of the very important DD, uh, DD cards is DD card, uh, where we'll have the database on the database nucleus, that'll be your session parameters. And all those session parameters are in fact documented um, in a session and are actually kind of split out into um, ones that are like, and whatever comes up here, Okay. Oh, there we go. For instance, what are what are all the parameters that deal with timing, inactivity, etc.? Okay, I got a little rambunctious and hit it twice. Transaction time limit explains it. A lot of good information in the documentation explaining session parameters, which you'll find in DD card. Um, license keys. Okay, so in a presentation I gave at a past user group, we discussed how there's different ways A to base on the on ZOS how you can provide the license key. You can provide it, you can link up a load module for every product uh, in the database suite that requires a license keys, and here they are, and you make those available in the step live um, so they can be loaded, or you can actually point a DD name to the respective um, license key. So there's two different ways. So your startup might have more than just associator data and work, P log, C log, DD print. You could have another 10 or so DD names, each pointing to different license keys. And again, those who are familiar with your own environment, you know which way you do. But if you inherit environment, might be something to look, saying, wow, this JCL doesn't look quite like what I'm used to. I don't do it this way. I, I use load modules. The person before me pointed to the um, 
the file. What dump DD name should be used? So there's SVC dump versus NPM dump. And again, this is specifically with the database nucleus. An NPM dump, if there's an ab end, it will produce a dump, but it might take a while. We've seen that before. It's like, all right, the, the nucleus is coming down, but it's it's taking quite a while to, to dump. It could be that you're writing to NPM dump. A faster way to set things up to provide a dump is using the SVC dump DD statement set to dummy. And in this particular case, if you're running out of an APF authorized library, I, I'm sure there's a reason people wouldn't be, but in most cases it's an APF authorized library, you will be writing um, into the sys1 dump data set, and that's where you'll find it. If for some reason you're not APF authorized, you'll get an Adam 77 message and the dump won't get produced. Now there actually is a little bit more information in the documentation and uh, on this, using the ZOS dump facility. And one thing I wanted to point out here is if you're not seeing the, uh, you're not getting a dump and you have ADA SVC dump, uh, DD dummy specified, your, your APF authorized, it could be that your system is suppressing the dump and you maybe need to ask some questions with the system guys. Um, they may have a good reason for it and maybe you have to fall back to NPM dump. For utilities, we write to SysU dump. Really not much more to say there. We're gonna look at some of the JCL requirements here in a second um, for running a utility, but all of our examples and samples we provide, SysU dump is in the utility. Now, DD print. This is a very important uh, piece, especially working with support that we ask for DD print. A lot of great information is provided there. First of all, it's gonna mirror what were your nucleus parameters? You might be pointing to you know, a PDS and a file, a little print there, good information. So when you send the output to DD print, we'll know exactly uh, what was in use at the time. Also the product version in the ZAP levels, something we'll look at or we'll ask you, hey, by any chance, do you have AN854028 applied? Well, look at your nucleus startup, see if it's applied. That's the, the best way to do it. Or we can look at ourselves, we're looking through, we're doing our diagnostics, you send us DD print, and we're like, oh, wait a minute, I think this app's gonna address the issue, let's see if they had it applied, and we can look ourselves. Uh, initialization information, gives you the mode, device, SVC number, your container files. Um, one of the things when it's printing out the container files, it puts block size. You might say, well, why is it doing that? Well, um, it's the block size that will match this 3390 device. And some old timers might remember user defined block sizes, but also um, we provide a number of different that are in the modules that you can use. If you want a, a larger block size for data work associator, you could just create a database. Um, as an 8390 logical device type, and you're gonna get a larger block size. This area also talks a little bit about large format file support, an IBM ZOS, get questions on that, and DF SMS managed files. So a little bit more information, uh, maybe take a, uh, just a refresher uh, read of that area. Now we do put uh, the jet, part of the JES log in the DD print, but we still ask you to send us the JES log because there could be something there. Uh, there's, there is more information around the environment, the operating system that we don't reflect in DD print. So, but we do uh, put the important things. And again, we saw this before coming up, what's your protection log that we're using, um, any other interfaces, multi, you know, we're coming up, et cetera. MLC. So, very important information, especially going forward. So I'm going to step back here and talk about mainframe license key for a second. Back in October, we introduced when Natural 922 and its family products were released on the mainframe. Again, we didn't release an database release. The next one will be uh, 861 in the fall, but right now it's 854 is the current release. It was about a year and a half ago, I think, when it was released. But with 922, we introduced MLC 138. Now, a lot of you might have one common uh, license key library that you use for all the products, so you're gonna introduce MLC 138 across the board. Understand with ML3 138, we no longer issue warnings, whether that be for natural, database, or whatever. Initialization is going to stop, okay? So um, you have to be cautious with that. 
And um, if you say, well, okay, I'm going to run natural 922. Let me run it with MLC 137. That way I still get my warnings. Unfortunately, you cannot do that. Uh, there is a check. Uh, we've tested it internally here. Natural, we run a batch natural. You try to point to MLC like 137. It will say, sorry, I can only use 138. Now I'm bringing this up in the database presentation because there was an database early warning that was released a couple of weeks ago. I think it was early warning 854, early warning three, where there was a compatibility issue with MLC 138 with database 854. Again, it wasn't released at the same time. There's compatibility uh, issue was detected. So they decided we better send this out as an early warning um, because again, uh, we're, we're going to stop initialization if you try to use 138. Well, in DD print, it will tell you right above at a section called machine data, where it will say the MLC, it will actually give you assembly date, oh, excuse me again, and the version and SM that you're running. So that information is there. And then you're going to get the machine data. So for licensing, what the first thing we're going to do is we're going to display what environment you're you're running on. You know, what is your machine environment? This data right here under current machine, this is what we're going to be checking against. So if this doesn't look right, um, you might you might have determined why, but it should be this exactly uh, what your machine configuration is. And then we're going to print off every license key that's involved in this environment. And as we saw on that previous slide, you could have up to 10, 11 different, besides database sub products, each one has its own license keys. We're gonna print it off. If there is an inconsistency, you get a license key check uh, error, you can actually sit right yourself and say, okay, my database license file has CPU 12345, and maybe, oh, my CPU ID is 54321. I have a mix match. I need a different license key. May help you uh, determine what the issue is. But after all of the license keys checks are done, you actually see a message that it has been completed. So some really good information on license checking and a little warning going forward with MLC 138. A lot of other good information is taken, and this is actually I put in another plug. I think uh, a lot of this information is used by Becky when she does the health check. She asks for this information. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of great detail, but you do get some uh, distribution on commands by source, thread, and file. Maybe a little tuning can go on there. Uh, user sessions, who are my usual suspects? Who issued the most calls? Who issued the most IOs? Who spent the most time in a thread? Is there an issue there? Does that make sense? or hmm, maybe we should go look at that job. Uh, format translation, buffer flushes, flush requests, again, all can be used for tuning. And then the high watermarks. This is also available in, a in AOS, but high watermarks for different pools, for instance, maybe you're occasionally you're getting an error message saying the whole queue's full or something like that. You can come out here in the high watermarks and see, wow, I have an H set to 4,000 and you're right, I'm 100% used. Do I have a problem with an application program, putting too many things on hold, not ending the transaction, or do I need to increase, or we've got more workload now and I need to increase the whole queue. So this information, high watermarks, maybe session by session, uh, you take a look, compare them, see if things are changing. And information on the, your container files, read and write distribution. Again, maybe a little performance and tuning. Not so much nowadays, the way operating system work, but a couple of decades ago, eh, it was kind of important. What am I writing on DD? Data R1 versus R2. Uh, maybe I need to move some files around. Uh, again, not as much now as used to be in the past. And in the um, documentation, database monitoring and tuning, if it jumps over there, it will actually go into detail of these different areas that you're going to find in DD print and the output and kind of explain things. You know, what 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 do you what are your takeaways? from these different areas, distribution by commands, et cetera. So again, some good information in the documentation. Database utilities, um, every uh, utility that's in the manual, we actually provide an example section. Here, I'm gonna use Ada Ord, so we're gonna jump over to the doc on it. And we'll just click down to ZOS. And then again, here's the cars. We'll talk about this here in a second. But we give an example. Depending on which function you're running, JCL may look a little different, but we try to give these examples here. Also in the jobs library, uh, there's JCL for Ada Ord to get you started. And between the two, between the manual and the sample, you, sample uh, jobs that we provide should get you going. 
Um, taking a look at the DD statements that are used uh, in this particular case, Ada Ord, it will use a DD file A and again go into documentation to reference it. Uh, if there's a recovery log, if you're running a recovery aid, you're going to need that. Of course, anytime Ada Run is being used, there's a DD card where you'll say, you know, program equals um, um, Ada Run or Ada Ord rather. Ah, it's right down here on the side here. Um, DD card is for Ada Run parameters. DD print is for the output for anything Ada Run might write out. For utility, utility the input is DD Carte, and we will write out the output to DD Druck. So you're going to get a couple of different printers and reader information, which leads me into the next one. Um, what diagnostics should be included in uh, when an Ada based incident is open? We kind of give uh, a little a shot here you can see this when you're in tso you're incomplete you know where you're going to find the different information like the jcln system messages your input and your output and again what dd statement is, uh, is being written to here or read from so provide all the nucleus output please include dd print check to make sure that if any output goes to a gdg or other data set uh, you include that um, some people do that also, if the problem is happening in review or replicator, for example, um, you could be getting a problems in SysRevDB, and that's in database 101, but the review hub is actually running on database um, 300, send both. Same thing with replication. Anybody who has a replication environment, you know that there are multiple pieces and parts to this on the mainframe. You have your replicator nucleus. In this case, maybe it's database 853. You have the database itself that's involved, database 200. And you may actually have the broker pstore file on its own database, database 108. If you're having a problem here, it might be good to send all of the, uh, excuse me, all of the environments from all three uh, started tasks to us. And then please clearly identify what you're sending. And I'm sure you're on the receiving end as being DBAs or even certain application programs, you're working with somebody else, you know what, how you want things explained to you um, when people come to you for assistance, no different. Um, all utility output in JCL showing the area if it's, if it's a utility. We do know that sometimes it's online, so include a screenshot of what the, the end user is seeing. It might help us put things into context. Sometimes we'll go back and we might ask you for an ADA rep. If, unless we actually ask, don't, don't print the FTGs. Some of these, that you, your own databases have hundreds and hundreds of files. As you know, if you run an ADA rep with an FTT, it is so much data. Um, a lot of times we're just looking for the top part of the ADA rep to kind of give us a layout and what we're looking for. Or we might just say, okay, give us an ADA rep and this a particular FTT for a particular file. And then include any details about what happened before, you know, you, maybe you admin it is a dump that you that you took, screenshots, behavior systems, errors, like in CICS, RACF. Um, there are times we'll go back and say, hey, can you go out to the system log, go back about five minutes and take a look, what was going on before database came down? Because we may just be collateral damage to something else that was going on. And uh, last, please try to avoid pasting large amounts of data in the incident description. I know in the incident management management portal, when you go and you look at updates, you see the latest updates, you know, in, inbound, outbound, and at the bottom is the description. And so you may not realize that, oh, wow, look at that. I cut and pasted and this thing goes on forever. Um, it's much better if we get it into a, a file, a text file, because then we can do searching and Development works out of a different systems. We're integrated. We pass things back and forth. It's so much easier for us. Get things quickly to development uh, in a crisis situation if things are delivered in a file. And then the last thing here is when sending a dump from ZOS to global support, if you can provide, this is some, a template we send to some customers. Say, hey, yeah, we're going to need a dump. And oh, by the way, can you fill this out? Can you tell us what the attributes, the file name on the mainframe was before uh, that you used? After you tersed it, LRECL in format, it should be PSFB 1024, very helpful. Sometimes it's not. It saves us a lot of time trying to determine, is this file good? Is the problem an Aryan? Was it not terse correctly, et cetera? And I think we all know you have to transfer files in binary uh, uh, for FTP when you're moving it from your mainframe to your PC before you uh, move it up into Software AG Secure Attachment Store. So a couple of things to check. 
And, you know, maybe one idea is you've never done this before, your new DBA, you have your a test database, you have your SVC dump there, is go ahead and create an ad bin. Find out where that dump is going to, where you're going to, where, where am I going to find this dump? How am I going to move this dump up and how am I going to get it to software AG and maybe go through uh, just as a little bit of a practice because the last thing you want to do databases down, for, maybe it's not coming back up. You get us on, on the phone, we need to get a dump sent to us. Um, it'd be good practice that you have the steps in place to get these large files moved to support. And Becky, I think that's it. And I'm only two minutes over. <laughs> that's fine, Kurt. <laughs> hey, Kurt, um, in uh, the chat, Helen uh, Kretzman and Julie Krause and everybody's been answering questions. I think there's one that I actually have a question on about license keys for DR. If if you don't know the CPU ID of your DR machine, can it be issued with a can can either you or logistics you being support issue a temporary key with that doesn't require a CPU ID? Yeah, no, that those are called emergency keys. So yeah, yep. you're stuck in a situation. The only thing support can generate is an emergency key. And, uh, give me a second, I'll talk about that. If in, when it comes to hey, I'm planning a, a disaster recovery, or hey, we know we're going to a new CPU, and here's the information. Those have to go to logistics. There's actually a form on. Um, if I can jump over there real quick. There's actually oh, a form I took, in. Him. I took the sharing away, so so go ahead and share your Whoop, screen. Again. Let me come back. Yeah, there's actually a form um, on Empower. If uh, I think it's uh, general support information. Let's see, see if you might know. Uh, da, 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 standard. No, wait. It maybe it's, maybe it's contact support. It's here somewhere. Uh, da, 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 da. Download components. Okay, I may have to have my team help me out here. There is a form that Logistics uses uh, to get license keys, um, and I thought it was again under general support information. Maybe I overlooked it. Okay, I will follow up with that because I can't find it right this moment. But anyway, logistics services center are the ones that have to create normal keys. If we get in a situation, we can uh, generate what we call an emergency license keys. It'll only be good for thirty, anywhere from seven to thirty days. And uh, but it doesn't do any checking. All it all it really checks is that hey, this is ZOS and it's database. That's all we care. And then you'll come up. It won't check CPU ID. Uh, MSU or anything, it comes up, it'll bypass it. But again, it's only temporary to get us through, you know, like through a weekend and then follow back up with logistics, your account executive, or find out why the current license key doesn't work. We'll take that, you know, to the next business day. All right, Hopefully perfect. I answered that. Good. Thank Good. you. Check, check products and documentation. Okay, did I look past it here? Oh, right there, there, order products and license. Thanks, Donnie. <laughs> it was there Thank all the you, time, folks. Thank you, Donnie. <laughs> but anyway, here's the order form. Uh, even if you're going, you, know, you, you can order, and this is actually can be used to order new products to say, oh, I saw, I see that natural 922 is out. I want to order that product. Go for it. Uh, come in here. Do I need a new license key? I'm going to a new CPU ID. Here you go. Code, version, what are my CPU IDs? This sends right to the Logistics Services Center, and they are very quick to respond, and it'll get you what you needed. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks, Donnie. Yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> So, yeah, thanks. That was great. Uh, I think we've got most of the questions answered over there. There's been a lot of chat today, so thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick again. OK, so we're going to wrap up. So before I go for the final gift cards, let me just kind of. Becky, you went on mute. Thank you. Yeah, for some reason, when I clicked on the slides, it threw me to mute. OK, so since my Internet was so spotty this morning, all I did was move across the room. Now it's fine, I think. So Arno talked about this stuff this morning and these these categories of stuff. These are what we kind of talk about when we do a health check. That's my next slide. I've, you know, myself, Patrick, Bob, Eric, Demos, we've done health checks for probably two thirds of you guys, if not more. And remember, you can do a health check at any time. So just reach out to me, your uh, account rep, your SE, whoever you want, call us support, support will let us know. We can do a health check. And for these health checks, it can really be whatever you want it to be. 
Um, it can be just, you know, like, do I do I have some performance issues? As Kurt said, we use a lot of the DD print output, all the different outputs. We can look at that, ADA reps as well. And we can say, oh, look, your buffer pool is too small. You need to do, you know, you need to make your flush pool bigger. You need to set this different. Um, lots of things we can concentrate on. We can talk about performance. We can talk about different ways to modernize your applications. You know, you guys have all these crazy, amazing applications that have been written in Natural or COBOL over the years that do just unbelievable things. And instead of trying to rip and replace it, let's modernize it. Let's let's create APIs or services out of that code that you already have. And if you need uh, your software AG database and natural applications to talk to Salesforce or anything else out there, we can do that. We've done it for lots of customers. So, you know, if you want to go uh, run, you know, mainframe and stuff in the cloud, it's called a hybrid environment. You can do that. If you want to run Linux, you can do that. You want to talk about product upgrades. You know, if you're a, a release or two behind and you want to just talk about how do I catch up and how do I get caught up where I don't have to worry about as soon as I do an upgrade, I'm out of support again. We we can help you create upgrade paths. We do this all the time. So lot, lots we can do in a health check. You decide we can do them. They don't cost anything. You guys don't pay anything. We can do them remote. Uh, where we just do everything via Teams, or uh, we can come on site. It's entirely your choice. Um, the roadmaps, all I really, I, I cut out so much here. There was like slide after slide after slide. With the roadmaps, the big thing is we're, we, we decided that we used to do two releases a year, April and October. We decided that for the most part, that's too much. It's too hard for you guys to stay current if we're creating new releases every six months. So primarily October, so October of 2024 is going to be our next release cycle. And the next one after that will be October 2025. It doesn't matter if you're running on the mainframe, if you're running on Linux or in the cloud, it doesn't matter. October is our release dates. Next user group will be October, November. We haven't set a date and a time yet. Well, we'll set a time. It'll probably be 11 to 2 Eastern time again. Uh, sometime October, November. Presentations, of course, we will have support doing more because there's always a lot of good information there. Um, if you would like to present like Josh did this morning, Josh did an excellent job. And Josh also pre pre presented at the International User Group in Dublin and had tremendous feedback. Um, so why don't you guys think about something you would like to present? Just your environment, some tips, techniques that you do that might be a little different than anybody else. If you've run into problems, you know, like heaven forbid you had the A to N58 and you didn't pay attention to it and you had a corrupted database. And yes, it has happened. Um, matter of fact, it happened last year to somebody. Um, you know, if, you if you've been through any situation that you think others could learn from, do a presentation and we can help you build the slides if you're not comfortable doing that. We can help you. We do have another customer, Husbanken from Norway, the bank. Uh, they are they presented at the April International User Group in Dublin. They're going to present at our North America Database and Natural User Group in the fall. They've already agreed to do that. I said support will be um, presenting. And remember, you will get a survey uh, after this user group meeting. Uh, if you return the results, and it's only like five questions, I think. If you return that survey before the before the end of business Friday, uh, today's what, the 15th? So that's the 17th. Return the survey before the 17th, and we will do a random drawing for a $100 Amazon gift card. Okay? So with that, I'm going to give away five more $50 Amazon gift cards. And... Let's see. I, I, I've got everybody printed out here. I'm just going to randomly select somebody. And the first one I'm going to go with this afternoon is Dave Kelly. Dave Kelly from, from Verizon. Congratulations, Dave. I'm glad to see you on. Gosh, I know Dave, how many different customers over the years. That means I've been at Software AG way too long. Okay, my next one is going to be Bruce McDonald. Bruce, I saw you online as well uh, throughout this thing. Bruce is with Royal Bank of Canada. Bruce, 
I've known you for a few years. Congratulations. Next one, Daniel Oliver from uh, State of Minnesota. I've known Daniel, gosh, I've been a software geek 37 years. I know practically everybody out there in the customer base. So Daniel, you're my next one. Congratulations. Uh, my next one, I'm gonna pick one here, is going to be Linda Ling. Linda Ling from SCI up in uh, Pennsylvania. Congratulations, Linda, and yeah, you were chatting away today, so thank you. And my 10th and final pick for the day is Mike Farmer from Bernhardt Furniture down in North Carolina. Congratulations, Mike. So with that, Nicole, Eddie, I don't know if you guys want to come off of mute, if you have anything um, you want to say. I, I do want to say, for those of you who won gift cards, so from this morning, earlier this morning, and the ones I just announced, Eddie has put his email address in the chat window there. It's Eddie Segura, but it's E-D-Y-N uh, dot Segura, S-E-G-U-R-A, at softwareag.com. Uh, send him an email with how you want the electronic gift card, Amazon gift card sent to you. Do you want it to your work email address or to your personal email, email address? So just email Eddie and uh, he will get those gift cards to you. Nicole, anything you want to add? Yes, thanks, Becky. Um, I put it in the chat, but I just want to make a call out. If you're a user on IBM Z and you'd like to share your story with the IBM Z community, we really invite you to join us at IBM Z Day, which is a virtual conference coming up uh, this fall. Um, please reach out to your account rep or myself. We have to submit uh, proposals by the end of June. So um, we really would love to feature um, you and your story, have you speak at this event, um, it would mean a lot. Thank you. What kind of a, a length of session are you looking for, Nicole? Is it just a few minutes, 20 minutes? Uh, usually, I think we've done this um, it's about two or three years ago, and I think the session could run from 30 to 45 minutes. Okay. And we can share space. So if you don't have that much to say for that long, uh, Software AG can come in and, and provide additional information, um, or you could take the whole time. Thank and you. I'm really gonna, I'm really gonna say that for those of you who are on the DBA side in particular, because you know that's where I come from, the database side. Those of you who are running Zip, you guys have some of the best stories out there. Because think about it, Adabase Zip is providing, on average, 90% CPU offload. Think about that. Think about what a great story that is for you to, to showcase with the broader IBM community, not just Software AG customers, but the broader IBM community. Uh, Zip is, is, is a no-brainer. But there's also, you know, you could talk about just like, like Josh did, you know, how they're on they're still on zos yet they're they've moved into this whole modern uh agile development environment you know using all the different open source tools out there like like github and and things like that so you know there's a lot of stories you guys could tell it's just that you you know we need you to tell it so we'd love to have you speak at our next user group or next year even, uh, but also at the IBM events. And by the way, uh, Software AG, if anybody's going to the IBM Share Conference in Kansas City in August, we will be there. My, I, I'm pretty sure Nicole will be there, I'll be there. Um, it's Kansas City, I can't remember the exact dates in August, but we will have a booth there. So we're always giving stuff away, you know, everybody loves some giveaways, but there's a lot of vendors there and you can come, you know, see what IBM's doing. IBM always has a, a great booth and great presentations. Uh, we like to go pick their brains, you know, like on encryption and new processors and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, with that, I think we can wrap up. We are pretty much on time. I went one minute over. So I do appreciate everybody taking the time out today. Look for the invite for the uh, fall user group. And again, we'd like to, if you would like, we'd like, love to have you present. Okay, everybody have a great rest of your day. And again, if you want health checks, reach out to me, anybody at Software AG, and they can direct you over to me. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye.